the objectifying habit, if I may call it that, which made the ideographic slash nomadic distinction possible in the first place, has clearly been embedded in European culture for far longer than any of the available genealogies of the human sciences would seem to suggest. Objectification, the ability to observe from the standpoint of the listening, rather than the speaking, subject 6 is an integral part of Western culture's passion for taxonomy. From Herodotus, through Giovanni de Pian del Carpani's description of the Mongols in the 13th century, through Giovanni Ramugio and Bernardino de Sahagan in the 16th, Richard Hocklet and Samuel Purchase in the 17th, down to the Recuil de Voyages in the 18th, the collection of data largely for immediate political or religious ends provided the European reader with some kind of access to cultures remote from his own point seven at least they offered a reminder that such cultures did exist. But unlike the modern anthropologist or ethnologist, the pre-modern observer's direct engagement with his subject, was a cause for suspicion. The 18th century orientalist, Abraham Hyacinth Ainquitil de Peron, was, said the Neapolitan philosopher Fernando Galliani, all that a traveler should be, exact, precise, incapable of creating any system, incapable of seeing what is useful and what not. Thus one should amass detail. To order such material, however, is another matter aid. Contact with the data could amount to contagion. Travelers because they travel it had a natural predisposition to the bizarre, something which, from the stance of the universal speculator made their testimony deeply unreliable. For in this race of authors, complained Shaftesbury, he is ever completed and of the first rank, who is able to speak of things the most unnatural and monstrous nine. Direct contact with the world could distort one's image of it. The traveler was also more inclined to notice, and describe difference than he was similarity, and Shaftesbury's concern was to 226. Demonstrate a degree of common agreement among men, a common and a universal moral sense. Francis Hutchinson, in many respects a disciple of Shaftesbury, was equally repelled by what he called the absurdity of the monstrous taste, which has possessed both readers and writers of travels, who are indifferent to all that is inherently virtuous in mankind on the grounds that these are but common stories. No need to travel to the Indies for what we see in Europe every day. 10. But, of course, it was precisely the confirmation that what we see in Europe every day could be seen equally in other, and indeed all, parts of the globe that both Shaftesbury and Hutchinson were searching for. Men were far more interested in human sacrifices than they were in the humdrum business of family love. And because of this concern with the unusual they were rarely, if ever, able to distinguish between what was truly universal, and thus worthy of study, and what simply amounted to mere detail. A fascination with exciting horror and making men stare led inevitably to a more general failure to distinguish between what was intrinsic to any particular society and what was not. Travel writers dealt, ultimately, in minutiae. The contemplative man, wrote Diderot, who professed a personal horror of travel, is a sedentary being, the traveler is either ignorant or a liar. He who has been granted genius as his lot, is contemptuous of the minute details of experience, and he who experiences is almost always without genius. 11. The limiting case of this is offered by Joseph Francois Lafitte's Moors de Sauvages Americains Comparise Auxiliary Moors de Premier's Temps, 1724. This is perhaps the first text to attempt to combine a substantial collection of data which the author himself had collected in the field with significant measure of universal speculation as to its meaning. Lafitte was widely read during the 18th century he is cited by Vico, Voltaire, Ferguson, Smith, Turgot, and many others but except for Vico, who cites him only as evidence for the superiority of his own method, and Voltaire, who made fun of his claim that Red Indians were red because their mothers wore red face paint, all of these writers read him exclusively as a source. Precisely because the arguments he made for the superiority of his method rested on his claims to ethnographic integrity, that method went almost unnoticed, until the early 20th century, and then it was hailed only on the grounds that its author had anticipated certain modern anthropological conceptions, rites of passage, for instance, 
the place which relative age plays in descent systems and the existence of distinctive kinship vocabularies. Point 12. The nomothetic aspect of the human science sees at least as it emerges in the 18th century has a more complex history. This begins in the late 17th century and it supposes, in the first instance, that the only possible way of transcending the challenge posed by scepticism on the part of those who wished to preserve some claim to certainty in human affairs was an appeal to a minimal, and seemingly self-evident, ethical claim. This took one of three forms, the self-preservation of Hobbes and Grotius, the primitive sociability of 227. Pufendorf, and what from a distance came out as much the same thing Shaftesbury's common moral sense. All such claims were, of course, arrived at by way of a thought experiment which involved the construction of a pre-social stage in man's history. This effectively shifted the understanding of what a natural universal law was away from that of supposedly innate and of course theocentric cognitive order to one based upon a concept of human needs. Humans, on all three of these accounts, needed to be social beings in order to survive both psychically and psychologically. But since needs could clearly only be judged in the particular instances in which they arose, they could, equally clearly, only be known through specific inquiries into specific cases. All three arguments for some minimal, and thus irrefutable, basis for sociability and in particular the last tower therefore, heavily dependent upon a body of ideographic data. Ancient history and modern travel accounts were ransacked for the evidence that all men everywhere and at all times displayed some instinct for sociability. Every authentic and well-written book of voyages and travels, wrote Cook's companion George Forster, in his translation of Andrew Sparman's Voyage to the Cape of Good Hope, 1785, is, in fact, a treatise of experimental philosophy. It is the modern philosophers chiefly, and the living instructors of our own times, who have mostly had recourse to these treasures as containing the best materials for the purpose of building their systems, or at least, as being best adapted to the support and confirmation of their doctrines. 13. The theory of natural sociability based upon needs, if treated historically, could offer an explanation as to why societies were so very different from one another over both space and time. It could also and this was to become crucial be incorporated into a general theory of progress. For needs grow exponentially. Changing needs make for changed persons. Humankind is, therefore, a category of being we can only hope to understand in terms of a process over time. We are, as Kant put it, not merely rational, but also temporalizing beings, and such beings can understand reasoning only under the form of time. Point 14 authority in both the cognitive and the social order had been constructed by human agents. They had not, as in the infamous Christian and absolutist systems, been given from the outside by some superior agent. Man, as Kant said, was not meant to be guided by instinct and instructed by innate knowledge, he was meant to produce everything out of himself. 15. To understand him, therefore, one had to unravel the process of construction. History thus became the point at which the ideographic and nomothetic converged, only a narrative of things in time could provide the basis for a science which sought to impose order upon the scattered and elusive data of the human condition. History therefore became, in Foucault's words the mother of all the sciences of man, which constitutes a favored environment which is both privileged and den. 228. Geros. To each of the sciences of man it offers a background, which establishes it and provides it with a fixed ground and, as it were, a homeland, patri, dot. 16 The progress of the human spirit, wrote Condorcet in the Esquisse de un tableau historique de progrès de l'esprit humain, is subject to the same general laws which we can observe in the individual development of our faculties, for it is the consequence of that development, considered as it manifests itself in a great number of individuals gathered together in society. But the result which each instant presents which depends upon that presented by previous incidents, and at the same time influences those times which will follow. This account, tableau, is therefore historical. Point 17. And in all such accounts, 
not merely Condorcets, the difference between peoples in the past and the European past that ice and peoples in remote cultures is collapsed into a single notion of savagery a term, it should be noted, whose origins are botanical and strictly not jurative. The distant savage thus becomes the laboratory in the field, a mode of access to modern European man's remote ancestor. As the reviewer of Lafitte's Moors de Sauvages Americains in the Memoirs de Trevoux of 1724 observed, Lafitte's method had made distances in time analogous to distances in space 18. The metaphysician and the moralist, argued Condorcet, had been concerned with the behavior of individuals. The historian of mankind, by contrast aimed at a study not only of the diverse societies which have existed at the same time, but also of those which existed in the succession of time. This was, it should be said, unashamedly a history of civilization 19. For that is, as Kant understood it, simply what anthropology or the human sciences, at this stage in their own internal history, were. This, however, raised, the problem of the necessarily relationship between the ideographic and the nomothetic in a particularly acute manner. All of the universal speculators I have been discussing took a strongly ethnocentric or present-centric view of the savage. This is not banal retrospective moralizing. It is the claim, we find made by Lafitte and others with direct experience of cultures widely different from their own so different in some cases that, as Lafitte recognized, our conceptual vocabularies might not be sufficient to describe them that if the kind of material such cultures provide is to be of any use for any kind of scientific project, then they had, first, as Lafitte put it, to be judged by their own habits and customs 20. Lafitte's own project had been to demonstrate the truth of Christianity, and thus the falsity of Bell's scepticism, by showing that all peoples share comparable religious beliefs and practices. But his objective was, on the basis of a meticulous sociology, and a detailed reading of classical history, to demonstrate the truth of Christianity. It did not, as previous works had done, begin with the assumption that Christianity, and the Christian Thomist tradition of natural law, was true, and then elaborate explanations which could account for why so many different people seemed so flagrantly to disregard it. The tendency, which in Lafitte's view all previous. 229. Writers on Les Sauvages had displayed, to treat ideographic data simply as data, detached, that is, from the historical specificities of each individual culture, could only in the end result in the proliferation of arid abstractions. As another comparativist, Nicole Antoine Boulanger complained in 1766, the philosophers, metaphysicians, and jurists in default of any history have sought to create their natural men through reason alone. What was really needed was a real human being in a real state. 21 It should be said that the states of nature used by the theorists of the 17th century, like those used by Rousseau and others in the 18th, have generally been taken to be entirely, and recognizably, counterfactual. The fact that Locke and Hobbes identified them with America, Rousseau with the Vaud, and so on have been assumed to be mere decoration. Point 22 They could be anywhere or any time. Their function was not demonstrative but heuristic. But that is not how contemporaries read them. Adam Smith's attacks and those of his Neapolitan contemporary Francesco Antonio Grimaldi and Rousseau, for instance, takes his claims about the state of nature literally. So, too, did Hume and Ferguson. And these people were, it does not need saying, neither willfully obdurate nor, themselves, unfamiliar with such conceptual strategies. You did not, of course, need to go into the field to avoid the charge of mere abstraction, but Eudidas Boulanger and several others recognized need to collapse the distinction between brute data and universal speculation. If the ideographic data in this kind of human science proved to be recalcitrant, you did not simply need, as Kant claimed, more theory. Point 23 You also needed a theory about what kind of data it was that you had. Guy Ambatista Vico, of course, famously made much the same kind of observation. All those who would use the evidence of, in this case, past societies to sustain their theories, he argued, 
had to be sensitive to what the causes were which governed past agents, and not merely impute to them an anachronistic causation of their own, as in Vico's view, the natural law theorists had done. The scholars, he complained want whatever they themselves know to be as old as the world 24. Yet we can scarcely understand and are absolutely unable to imagine how the man of Grotius, Puffendorf and Hobbes must have thought 25. And if we could not do that we could not easily assume that this man's inference from the discomfort of his primitive condition would be that he ought to abandon the state of nature and form a civil society. The point Vico is making or at least one of the points he is making just the claim now familiar to those who worry about counterfactuals that possible worlds had to be properly true to some kind of antecedent factual reality. 3. There is a further dimension to this account. Scepticism in particular Cartesianism together with Lockean sensationalism, had, as Jean D'Alembert among others, recognized, performed the invaluable service of dumping the whole scholastic edifice which had been built up from Aquinas through to 230. Suarez on the notion of innate ideas. But Descartes himself had also attempted to replace it by an overly austere claim that the only usable knowledge had to possess the certainty of mathematics. 26 Everything else belonged to the realm of opinion. And while opinion might be interesting it could never count as knowledge. This made any kind of human science unworkable, for in the end opinion was all that any such science had to rely upon. The task as Donald Kelly explains in this volume 27 was to invest opinion with a new dignity. Probability was, after all, the closest you could get to truth in human affairs, and human reason, as Locke had said, was only a potent enough instrument so long as man refrained from using it to plumb the ocean of being. While the model of the natural sciences might be a useful one, no account of human behavior could hope to reproduce the mathematical certainty or range of those sciences. For the human scientist, unlike the natural, is crucially what he is studying. As Michel Loris once observed of his own attempts to be a true ethnographer, it is always our own kind, nos semblabis, which we are observing, and we cannot adopt towards them the same indifference of, for instance, the etymologist 28. In our post kenyan world, I suspect that we have largely lost sight of the full significance of this crucial distinction between the possible objectives of the natural and human sciences. But when Charles Taylor published his now famous paper Interpretation and the Sciences of Man in 1971, he was conscious that his conclusion that human science looks backward. It is inescapably historical was, although certainly not new indeed Aristotle had said something similar was nevertheless, radically shocking to the predominantly American social science community, to which it was addressed, because it broke with a tradition which aspired to some kind of indivisibility in both scientific method, and what would count as scientific conclusions. Point 29 When Locke, Condillac, Condorcet, and Buffon made similar distinctions, that tradition was still unstable. But I think that the insistence of their claims indicates the force with which they could all see the kind of reductionism to which scientism, in particular the highly seductive claims of Grotius and Hobbes, could ultimately lead. To want to create a science of man which would attempt to establish first causes was part of what Vico called the arrogance, Borea, of scholars, and it could only result in metaphysics. The sciences del home or the history of mankind belonged, then, not with the new astronomy and physics which, in their different ways had made such an impact on the 17th century natural law theorists. It belonged, instead as Perches, and even more clearly perhaps Giovanni Ramugio, had understood with those new kinds of Baconian science, cartography, hydrography, and geology, which had emerged during the 16th and 17th centuries and which, as Antonio Pérez Ramos has argued, by aiming not at epistemic certainty, but at a measure of descriptive accuracy, had generated a whole cluster of now attainable objects of knowledge. 30. The human sciences were to provide an account of effects or to use an earlier language secondary causes by means of an examination of their ori. 231. Jin, as far as that could be known, and of their development. Such sciences had two properties. They were in the first instance progressive. All, that is, 
were concerned with establishing the state of the present, and in particular a present condition which, during the second half of the 18th century came increasingly to be described as a civilization. The progress they described was assumed to be, as much for Montesquieu as it had been for Aristotle, from the simple to the complex. Dougald Stewart, for instance, observed of Smith's dissertation on the origin of languages, 1793, that this was a specimen of a particular sort of inquiry, which so far as I know, is entirely of modern origin and which addressed the question, by what gradual steps that transition has been made from the first simple efforts of uncultivated nature to a state of things so wonderfully artificial and complicated. 31. All such histories existed as Lafitte's work had donate a junction between an account of an historical process and the description of data collected from the field, an enterprise which became, archetypically, Vico's jurisprudence of mankind based upon an understanding of the common customs of peoples. But here Vico's project in the Science on Wova, Condorcet's in the Esquisse de un tableau historique de progrès de l'esprit humain and Kant's in the idea for a universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose, begin to look quite unlike any part of any history of modern human science. The purpose behind this was to reveal, in Condorcet's formulation, to the philosophy politique, the true nature of all our own prejudices 32. And this brings me to the second property of such histories, their concern not with individuals but with collectivities. Cartesian skepticism may, as D'Alembert in the Discars Preliminaire pointed out, have lifted the yoke of scholasticism, but it had replaced it by nothing but the most extreme form of solipsistic reasoning. 33 The anti foundationalism of much of the thinking of the late Enlightenment, that of Kant himself, of Diderot, Herder, and of course of Kant's own Newton of the moral world, Rousseau, derives from a rejection of the sheer and humanly impossible self-centeredness of the Cartesian project. A self-centeredness which would have made any kind of human science impossible. Knowledge of the human world required not merely a high degree of epistemological modesty and was inescapably the examination of collective acts, it had itself to be a collective act. The conjectural historian could no more be detached from his own place in the scheme he was attempting to describe, than he could be distinguished, as a rational being, from his object of study. Or, as Taylor puts it, a study of the science of man is inseparable from the an examination of the options between which men must chose 34. This is, as Onora O'Neill has shown, most powerfully true of Kant, but Kant's own position owes much, as he himself made clear, to Bacon, whose in commune consultant provides the epigraph for the critique of pure reason. 35 It is this emphasis not only on the collectivity as the true object of study, but on the place of the historian, which explains the centrality in many such conjectural histories of an account of the origin and development of language, for the 232. Invention of language was, of course, the supreme collective act. The invention of the arch, wrote Condorcet, was the work of a man of genius, the creation of a language was the work of an entire society. The third epoch of the Esquisse runs from the invention of agriculture, which by attaching man to the soil he cultivates 36 makes for the fixity which was, for Condorcet as much as it had been for Aristotle, a necessary condition of civility, to the creation of the alphabet which demands what he calls a double doctrine 37. Similarly the invention of printing at the end of the seventh epoch, is identified as the final stage before the arrival of the true age of scientific understanding, because printing, of course, makes collective cognitive action, finally accessible to all. 38 human history has, of course, its ups and down, its false starts, and its catastrophic reversals. But Condorcet, in common with most, if never quite all, of the historians of mankind, was always insistent that ultimately it was a narrative of irreversible progress towards increasing scientific detachment final unmasking of all our prejudices. Few modern human sciences would, I suppose, take the unmasking of prejudice to be their goal. But for the Enlightenment, the history of mankind was a project with a clear and declared political purpose. It was, ultimately to teach man how to live a better collective life. 
and it was to achieve this by allowing him to see the story of his existence for what it was. In this it shares something with the human sciences as they have been conceived by a number of modern practitioners from Foucault to Clifford Geertz as efforts to render various matters on their face strange and puzzling. 39. There is another and for any disciplinary history still more unsettling aspect to these projects. The modern human sciences are conceived as, to use Taylor's phrase, ex post facto understanding. For their 18th century creators, however, and in particular for Condorcet and Kant, they were also believed to possess important predictive possibilities. Both the esquisse and the idea for a universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose, and with general outlines for a future state of mankind, and both were written with that purpose in mind. Condorcet's longer text, which was never written would have been overwhelmingly concerned with such prospects. For if once, it was argued, we are empowered to see the world as it is, by properly understanding how it came to be, then there is no reason why the progression which had begun with one thought experiment state of nature should not end with another. Furthermore both Condorcet's utopian tenth epoch and Kant's far more modest ninth proposition are not merely predictive. They are also prescriptive. These observations, declared Condorcet at the beginning of the esquisse, on what man has been, on what he is today lead directly to the means of ensuring and accelerating the new developments which he may still hope to make 40. Underpinning these claims was another, that man must progress in a way which is discoverable from past experience, because, as Kant remarked, it must be assumed that nature does not work without a plan and purposeful end, even amidst the arbitrary play of human freedom. The philosophical mind must. 233. Therefore, be able to produce the ultimate universal history following, as he puts it in a priori rule. This is not, Kant insisted, intended to supersede the task of history proper, that of empirical composition, but rather to come at the data such history might offer from a different angle. 41 The outcome of this encounter would prove, as he said in the conflict of the faculties, to be a narrative of things imminent in future time, consequently as a possible representation a priori of events that are supposed to happen there. What form these events will have is not clear. But it is clear that for Kant the two components of any practical anthropology, with which I began this paper what Kant himself describes as brute data and philosophical reflection theodographic and the nomothetic could only be fully integrated not in any vision of the modern, disengaged discipline, but in some projection for a future state designated and divinatory and yet natural 42. I end here, in the future with the observation that, from the point of view of a history of a discipline it is important not merely to identify the shape of the development, the genealogies, the origins, and so on of recognizable intellectual enterprises. It may also be important to look more attentively than we perhaps do at the objectives that, in the course of time, those projects have been compelled to shed. For the history of mankind in the 18th century, was founded upon the assumption that even if there was no evidence for the existence of a purposeful God, nature clearly had a purpose, and that mankind was, because of his participation in nature compelled to develop in certain ways and not in others. For Condorcet or Kant to have acknowledged that their own intuitions about the historicity of the sciences of man implied, in Taylor's words, that the very terms in which the future will have to be characterized, if we are to understand it properly, are not at all available at present would have constituted a denial of the possibility of any kind of anthropology 43. For us it seems, almost, self-evident. 237. Part 4. Natural Sciences. 239. Francis Bacon and the Reform of Natural History in the 17th Century Paula Findelin Do you really think it is easy to provide the favorable conditions for the legitimate passing on of knowledge? 1. In the final decade of the 16th century, Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, younger son of Elizabeth I's Lord Keeper of the Seal, and an English lawyer of middling years with some modest success and even larger aspirations set out to redraw the map of knowledge. All this is well known, 
since Bacon belongs to the canon of individuals whose innovations comprise our image of the scientific revolution. In this capacity, Bacon has been hailed variously as the father of induction, the first serious proponent of experimentation, and the blueprint for modern man. Bacon, the disgraced Lord Chancellor who thought that dying of pneumonia while attempting to ice a chicken was equivalent to Pliny's demise in sight of Vesuvius, both giving their lives for curiosity, as he wrote in his deathbed missive to the Earl of Arundel II, is an especially compelling figure in the history of Renaissance thought. He left behind reams of instructions on how to investigate nature and an equally lengthy list of directives on the proper demeanor of the natural philosophers entrusted with his new method. As Bacon argued repeatedly in his many works, his goal was to make natural philosophy a profession, a business, and a matter of state, it was to have primary rather than secondary status among the variety of human endeavors. This contrasted dramatically with its current state, as Bacon described it, natural philosophy was never any profession, nor never possessed any whole man, except some monk in a cloister, or some gentleman in the country, and that very rarely, but became a science of passage to season a little young and unripe wits, and to serve for an introduction to other arts. He wrote in his Phylum Labyrinthi.3 instead Bacon proposed to make natural philosophy important and permanent. Science was to become something that civil society would take seriously. Central to Bacon's reform of natural philosophy was his image of natural. Thanks to Deborah Harkness, Mordecai Feingold, Alex Cooper, and audiences at Harvard, the Folger Shakespeare Library, and the Renaissance Society of America for their bibliographic suggestions and comments. 240. History as a Foundational Discipline As many scholars have noted, natural history became increasingly important to Bacon as the years passed. For in his forties, it was simply one part of a vast program of reform, a stepping stone on the royal road to knowledge. Natural history was not an especially elevated component of his original project but a convenient rubric under which to accumulate particular experiences that would yield better and more lasting philosophy. As Bacon entered his sixties, less sanguine about his ability to involve others in the work of his project and more conscious of the difficulties of completing his encyclopedia within his own lifetime, natural history occupied more of his time and energy and, accordingly, assumed greater importance in his writings. Natural history is the foundation of all, he affirmed in the New Organon, 1620.5 Elsewhere he suggested that while natural history could exist without natural philosophy, the latter would essentially vanish without the former. Point six. This was a message that Bacon's heirs thoroughly members of the Royal Society and the communities of naturalists in Oxford and Cambridge during the second half of the 17th century would take to heart. Despite the importance of natural history to Bacon's program of intellectual reform, it remains a relatively undervalued aspect of his work. In the scores of books and articles produced on Bacon in the last few decades, I have yet to find a single one that explains why Bacon chose natural history as his main point of departure. Point seven in many respects, it was not an obvious choice for him to make. Natural history was not yet a strong tradition in England in the late 16th century relative to its popularity on the continent, its heyday in that country lay in the 1660s through 1690s and beyond rather than in this earlier period. And Bacon himself evinced little direct interest in late Renaissance natural history. Certainly he was familiar with Aristotle, Pliny, and Dioscorides but, of modern naturalists, he mentioned only Conrad Gessner, George Agricola, and Jose Acosta by name. Not once did the name of Ulysses Aldrovandioase III Volume Ornithology, 1599-1603, appeared precisely during the period in which Bacon accelerated his project Grace His Works. Instead Bacon displayed greater knowledge of the writings of encyclopedists such as Francesco Patrizzi, Bernardo Telesio, and Girolamo Cardano, the natural magic tradition as practiced by Giovanni Battista della Porta and Giordano Bruno, and the chemical philosophy of the Swiss physician Paracelsus. Yet arguably these writers contributed equally to the tradition of natural history since it was not yet a field with strictly defined boundaries. Point eight. Of course Bacon often chose not to cite authors whom he read, 
putting into practice his advice that knowledge be born from experience rather than authority, so we cannot simply take the absence of names as a literal indicator of what he did or did not know. And yet for anyone versed in the natural history tradition, Bacon's own natural history seems striking devoid of the common markers that we associate with this genre, no lengthy descriptions of flora and fauna, no discussions of etymology, number of toes and fronds, or other classificatory devices, no humanist embellishments nor even pictures grace such works. 241. As the Silva Silvarum, 1627. Natural history had come to mean something quite different to Bacon than it had traditionally connoted, like natural philosophy it was in need of reinvention. This transformation absorbed other disciplines into natural history, ostensibly making them more useful to society, public sciences rather than private indulgences. Ever conscious of genre, Bacon acknowledged that his own natural history did not conform to prior definitions of this subject. As he confessed in his final work, for this writing of our Silva Silvarum is, to speak properly, not natural history, but a high kind of natural magic. For it is not a description only of nature, but a breaking of nature into great and strange works. 9. Natural history, in other words, provided a rubric under which to pursue forms of inquiry that were incapable of full redemption in their current state. It provided the via media between the academically exalted field of natural philosophy and both the occult sciences and the crafts traditions, each in their own way problematic for the creation of the socially elevated, morally unambiguous and publicly useful form of science that Bacon championed. Drawing upon these various fields of knowledge and sanitizing them through their relabelling as natural history, Bacon strove to create an approach to nature that would make its study and its practitioners more deserving of public recognition. This essay explores Bacon's attitude towards natural history, as it developed from the 1590s through the 1620s. It considers Bacon's reform of natural history in light of interest in nature at the Elizabethan and Jacobean courts and more generally among the English aristocracy. Bacon's immediate context provides important background to his ideas. As we shall see, Bacon's distaste for certain aristocratic values proved to be an essential part of his critique of natural history and, more generally, natural philosophy. The courtly pursuit of science a leisurely pastime with no discernible contribution to the public good was precisely what Bacon disliked most about the current state of natural knowledge. Science was a pleasurable though inconsequential pursuit when instead it ought to be a matter of great affair. Point ten. But how was this transformation to be effected? Central to Bacon's program of reform was the idea of discipline. To create a new natural history, the natural philosopher had to cultivate a different demeanor. Bacon's naturalist was to become the model knower. Imagining Renaissance alchemists, naturalists, and natural magicians as cultivators of trivial arts, Bacon proposed to purge all scientific inquiry of suspect philosophies and humanist embellishments. In his Thoughts and Conclusions, 1607, he recommended that his readers cultivate a disciplined firmness of mind. This was also the site of his famous phrase, nature cannot be conquered but by obeying her, suggesting that nature itself provided the preparatory discipline for its observers. By the time his new organon, 1620, appeared, Bacon advised natural philosophers to restrain themselves, till the proper season, from generalization 11. Only through such acts of self-denial could science truly realize its potential, allowing the faculty of reason to overcome that of imagination, making memory its tool. Point 12 If natural history 242 could not be reformed then science would remain as it had always been, according to Bacon, a subject fit to exercise the minds of children and a leisurely pursuit for gentlemen who delighted in esoteric wisdom and exotic phenomena. Reforming natural history became an essential step in giving natural philosophy a greater place in the realm of knowledge. To do this, Bacon demanded that natural history give up some of the humanist traits that had made it so popular with the upper classes in the preceding century. Lack of method, as Bacon defined it, had led to the undisciplined state of current knowledge. 
what they lack is any art or precepts to guide them in putting their knowledge before the public, he wrote in The Masculine Birth of Time, 1603. Thirteen discipline was a means of narrowing the enterprise, making natural history a proper history of nature rather than a repository of the encyclopedic imagination, without it, the natural philosopher could not recognize the true laws of nature. It also dignified natural history by making it a nobler enterprise. Natural History at the Elizabethan Court Before examining Bacon's views on natural history, we should consider the state of natural history in Elizabethan England. In his Thoughts on Human Knowledge, 1604, Bacon commented on the small part played by natural history in the university curriculum. Elsewhere he wrote that scholastic philosophers knew little history 14. In contrast to continental Europe, where professorships in Materia Medica, museums of natural history and botanical gardens had flourished since the 1530s, no university in England taught any aspect of natural history as a separate field of study until well after Bacon's death. Despite John Gerard's attempt to found a botanical garden at Cambridge in 1588, there was no botanical garden at any English university until the establishment of the Oxford Botanical Garden in 1620. The chair in botany to accompany this garden did not appear until 1669.15 by 1605, when Bacon wrote The Advancement of Learning, he noted the beginnings of such a material culture, we see likewise that some places instituted for physic have gardens for the examination and knowledge of simples of all sorts, and are not without the use of dead bodies for anatomical observations. Nonetheless Bacon concluded that this was not enough to satisfy his idea of experience. But these respect but a few things 16. In the 1570s, when Bacon studied at Cambridge, the only means by which natural history entered the curriculum was via the teaching of Aristotle and Pliny in the third year course in philosophy or in informal conversations with professors such as the physician John Caius who published his history of rare animals and plants in 1570.17 For all these reasons, Bacon was right to point out that natural history had been undervalued by the academic establishment.18 Despite the paucity of formal instruction in this area, However, it is worth noting that some of the foremost naturalists in Tudor England William Turner. 243. John Caius, William Gilbert, Thomas Moffat, and Thomas Penny studied at Cambridge like Bacon. So we cannot entirely discount the role of the universities in enhancing the status of natural history. If nothing else, the medical and more generally the arts curriculum provided a setting in which professors could inform students of this ancient discipline and introduce them to new research in this area. While natural history made few inroads in the English universities, it became increasingly popular at court and among the upper classes. 19 On the continent the disciplinary status of natural history had been established by its attractions for patricians and its subsequent institutionalization, in England this was accomplished primarily by its value as a cultural commodity as well as its growing importance in the imperial ambitions of Elizabethans. As Mordecai Feingold observes in his study of the place of science in Elizabethan and Jacobean England, like heraldry, botany, and horticulture were frequently pursued in a leisurely fashion by those of a certain class and were considered as basic as good manners 20. By the late 16th century natural history was one of several sciences that had achieved noble status. Unlike alchemy and mathematics, practiced mostly notably in England by the Elizabethan Magus John D. 1526-1608, it had the virtue of accessibility. Cultivated by nobles, physicians, herbalists, gardeners, and court poets, it was a field of study that did not demand special skills from its practitioners or a privileged state of being to be initiated into its mysteries. While mathematics was practiced by university scholars and the merchant elite, and alchemy by a handful of adepts, natural history appealed to a broad sector of the educated populace. Natural history was made accessible to Elizabethans not only through the introduction of its ancient works into the university curriculum but also through the increased circulation of texts and the growing presence of naturalists in the city, in the homes of the upper classes, and at court. 
During the second half of the 16th century natural histories increasingly found their way into the private libraries of Elizabethans.21 By Bacon's day one could find many nobles who owned copies of Pliny as well as indigenous natural histories such as William Turner's A New Herbal, 155,168, John Gerard's Herbal, or Jean Rawl History of Plants, 1597, William Gilbert's On the Magnet, 1600, and Edward Topsell's History of Four-Footed Beasts, 1607. Such works were placed alongside the lengthy natural histories written by such continental naturalists as Conrad Gessner, Ulysse Aldrovandi, and Charles de Eleclus, and travel narratives such as the 1577 translation of Nicholas Menard's Joyful News Out of the Newfound World and Thomas Harriet's Brief and True Report of the Newfound Land of Virginia, 1590, that highlighted New World flora and fauna. Certainly Bacon's knowledge of Gessner and Acosta was a product of the new place of natural history in Tudor libraries, and its intersection between humanist and cycloptism and dreams of global conquest. Bacon's reading of Acosta's Natural History of the Indies, in which Aristotle became an object of derision when his theories failed to live up to brute experience. 244. Was in keeping with his image as a patron of the English voyages of discovery at the turn of the century. Like many prominent Elizabethans he found the image of an English empire to be particularly appealing, economic expansion, political might and mastery of nature all came together in the possession of the New World. 22 Bacon's continued interest in Harriet's projects suggests that he particularly followed the scientific work done by those involved in the establishment of an English colony in North America. Harriet, 1560-1621, and the artist John White had popularized the natural history of North America upon their return to England in 1587, laden with specimens and illustrations. 23 The intellectual riches of Walter Raleigh's expedition to Virginia, which quickly found their way into the work of leading naturalists such as John Gerard and Thomas Moffat, must have fueled Bacon's fantasies about the knowledge that lay just beyond his grasp. Yet it also frustrated him precisely because it lay in someone else's handsmen such as the court physician Moffat or the court astrologer D. whom Bacon did not trust to transform the wonders of the Americas into the hard facts of natural history. Natural history became a much discussed subject among the English nobility and merchants as books and objects entered their homes as a result of the increased importance of travel among the upper classes. Yet mere possession was not enough. How one read Acosta or Harriet or what one did with natural objects mattered. From this perspective, Bacon's program of natural history was as much an attempted reformation of the reading and collecting habits of Elizabethans as a call for a new philosophy of nature. In his writings Bacon assumed that his audience had some familiarity with the literary tradition of natural history. This knowledge both aided and hindered his project. While almost never citing specific works, Save for an occasional mention of the ancients who founded this discipline, Bacon nonetheless worried that his readers would misunderstand his project as the one with which they were already familiar. For this reason, he constantly underscored its difference, lest men for want of warning set to work the wrong way, and guide themselves by the example of the natural histories now in use, and so go far astray from my design 24. Such fears reflected Bacon's view that while natural philosophy was relatively unknown to the general reading public, natural history instead suffered from being too popular. Readers of Pliny and Gessner might mistake these texts as the inspiration for his work when instead Bacon hoped to redirect their attention away from the ancient traditions of studying nature and towards the new natural history that took travel and exploration as its point of departure. Bacon could measure the success of natural history among his contemporaries not only by the growth in published volumes but also by the number of works dedicated to Tudor monarchs and their close associates. Several decades before Bacon proclaimed natural history a royal work, the community of naturalists implicitly had given it that label by dedicating their histories to various monarchs. 25 Edward Wooten addressed his On the Differences of Animals, 1552. 245. To Edward VI. William Turner, CA 1508-101568, 
one of the first Englishmen to study natural history on the continent, directed the three installments of his herbal to no less a patron than Elizabeth I. Two years later, Matthias de Elabel, 1538-1616, followed suit with his new plant controversies, 1570. Court counselors and favorites also were perceived as appropriate patrons. John Gerard, 1545-1612, dedicated his popular herbal to Elizabeth's most trusted counselor William Cecil, Lord Burley, who had also briefly patronized Turner, from such episodes we know that Bacon's uncle evidenced some interest in natural history in addition to his well-known pursuit of alchemy. 26 Thomas Moffat chose Mary Herbert, Countess of Pembroke, as his preferred patron while also enjoying the support of Lord Willoughby and the Earl of Essex, Bacon's important patron. Thus by the time Bacon conceived of natural history as the key to his new philosophy, it had already received widespread support and approval among the very people from whom he sought support. Point 27 Living in Essex's principal residence York House on the Strand during the Earl's stay in Ireland, Bacon surely came into contact with the naturalists who flocked to this court favourite, while observing at close hand the activities of his relatives the Cecils in the same part of London. Point 28 Bacon's predecessors and contemporaries may not have dignified natural history in the way that he intended, but they had certainly ennobled it and perhaps planted the seeds of the idea that would lead Bacon to highlight this particular discipline in his reform of natural philosophy. By the 1570s, the decade when Bacon first began his studies, interest in natural history accelerated due to increased contact between England and the continent as well as the expeditions to the Americas. Bacon himself was to benefit from this situation since his stay at the French court, 157,679, in the service of the English ambassador probably brought him into contact with French collectors of natural curiosities such as Bernard Palissy and the royal surgeon Ambroise Peer. A few decades later, the same diplomatic channels allowed John Tradescant the Elder to collect plants for Bacon's cousin Robert Cecil to place in his garden at Hatfield.29 at the same time that Bacon enjoyed his first taste of travel, foreign naturalists, particularly from Italy and the Low Countries, were making their way to England. The Flemish naturalist Matthias de Elabel first arrived in England in 1567, bringing with him the manuscripts of his mentor Guillaume Rondelet. His presence in London until his death in 1616 facilitated communications between English and continental naturalists, contributing to the sort of naturalist's republic of letters that Bacon later advocated in his own writings. Point 30. While Elabel connected Protestant naturalists across the Channel, intense curiosity about Italy made English nobles more aware of the centrality of natural history to Italian elite culture. They rediscovered nature in their travels and studies in that region, where they visited the famous theater of nature of Ulysse Aldrovandi in Bologna, the botanical gardens in Pisa and Padua and the Grand Ducal Menagerie in Florence. They participated in this new research when they attended Fabricius's anatomical lectures in Padua, where the Aristotelian. 246. Program of Natural History was being revived, and botanized in such notable locations as Monte Baldo near Verona. Of all these activities, the public and private gardens cultivated by Italian patricians most captivated their imagination. As early as the 1570s Elizabethan gardens were imitating their Italian counterparts. In subsequent decades botanical enthusiasts such as Burley, whose garden in Theobalds on the Strand was the delight of his contemporaries, employed Italian gardeners and English gardeners familiar with the Italian style, and cultivated the services of the Italian physicians whom Elizabeth employed. 31 Natural history was so clearly a preferred leisure activity in Italy that the educated Elizabethans could not help but be drawn to it as they modeled themselves after Italian courtiers, it coincided well with the pastoral lifestyle that they celebrated. By the 1590s, when Bacon began to mention natural history in his writings, the increased circulation of printed texts, the growing presence of naturalists in London and the desire for cultural emulation all made natural history attractive to the English nobility. The tangible importance of natural history in Elizabethan England was found not only in the pages of printed texts, replete with emblems, adages, and morals, 
but also in the uses of nature at court. Given Bacon's position son of Elizabeth's keeper of the seal, a member of parliament and an aspiring barrister who participated in several court masks in the 1590s way must think of the court as an important setting in which Bacon observed the growing popularity of natural history among his contemporaries. Their natural history was a lavish enterprise that was essentially indistinguishable from many other cultured pursuits. Nature was the subject of lengthy poems such as Philip Sidney's Arcadia and Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, and the backdrop for popular images such as Nicholas Hilliard's Young Man Among the Roses, ca. 158,788. Natural history also became the source of many of the emblems that decorated the closets and banquet houses of Elizabethans. All this was done in imitation of the Queen, whose dresses increasingly looked like a mobile natural history. We need only recall the Hardwick portrait, ca. 1599, in which Elizabeth I appeared wearing a dress embroidered with the marvels of nature, or the rainbow portrait, ca. 160,003, in which Robert Cecil and John Davies probably played an important role, to realize how literally natural history was woven into the fabric of elite society.32. Despite his alleged aversion for this sort of display Bacon himself participated in the decorative arts of natural history. At the end of 1599 he offered the Queen a New Year's gift of a white satin petticoat, embroidered with snakes and fruit simages that appeared in the Hardwick portrait that same year and which, in addition to being favoured by the Queen, allowed Bacon to obliquely suggest that she embodied the dubious virtues of Eve.33 Bacon also did a great deal of his writing in a house decorated with emblematic images of nature, in anticipation of Elizabeth's visit to Gorhambury in 1577, his father Nicholas had added a wing to the family estate decorated with enameled glass windows portraying various allegories of nature. Moreover Nicholas had placed a statue. 247. Of Orpheus at the entrance to the estate garden an image that would reappear prominently in Bacon's own allegory of philosophy and constructed a banquet house filled with portraits of the famous philosophers, rhetoric eons, and astrologers of the ages, from Aristotle to Copernicus. 34 Thus Bacon's reaction to certain strands of natural history, which privileged the exotic and allegorized each image, emerged from full knowledge of the courtly approach to nature as a participant in its games. The prominence of natural history in Elizabethan England and its relation to other disciplines surely influenced Bacon's choice of subject. Natural history offered many advantages from his perspective. First, it was a relatively new and untried field of study, open to alteration and rapidly expanding as a result of the voyages of exploration and discovery. While Aristotle and Pliny had offered many interesting theories and observations about the natural world and encouraged their readers to collect information, they had never really told naturalists how they should observe or what their observations would add up to, moreover their viewpoint seemed increasingly provincial as a changing geography made the physical limits of their knowledge more discernible. In short, it was an encyclopedia without much form or shape, bulging with new information and in need of some intellectual guidance. Second, natural history was an unspecialized domain that, at its core, produced a simple, expandable, and relatively unprivileged form of knowledge. The accessibility of natural history appealed to Bacon who argued that the leveling of wit was one of his primary tasks. Rejecting alchemy and natural magic as they were then practiced, Bacon observed that while both might yield insight into the nature of things neither the alchemist nor the magician would be a good model for his ideal observer. Since they specialized in secretive arts, they could not successfully manage the creation of public knowledge, Bacon's primary goal. Likewise the mathematician was an inappropriate figure because his knowledge, though potentially utilitarian, was also not easily conveyed. By contrast, the naturalist worked within the public domain, his was a communicative and collaborative enterprise that drew upon many different sectors of society. Finally, Bacon approved of natural history because it was a noble enterprise. Natural history had occupied some of the greatest minds of antiquity and been patronized by two of its greatest monarchs, Alexander the Great and King Solomon. 
it was a noble rubric for fairly ignoble worth gathering and recording of date and its management and patronage could be presented as an exalted undertaking. While natural history was not as intellectually elevated as natural philosophy, it may have been socially preferable. Bacon's attention had first been caught by the increased visibility of natural history among the nobles with whom he consorted his uncle Lord Burley, his cousin Robert Cecil, and patrons such as Essex and Elizabeth I. He had probably observed its presence on the margins of the university curriculum during his student days and continued to note its popularity as he made his way through Gray's Inn and 248. Ultimately the court. For all these reasons, Bacon imagined the reformation of natural history as a fairly obvious conduit to lead his audience along the path he intended. He would persuade them of the merits of his fact-gathering enterprise, convince them that natural history could be something other than courtly entertainment, and reclaim science as worthy endeavor. With this in mind, he set down some guidelines for his readers to follow. The Flight from the Trivial When Bacon began to compose his new philosophy, he advised his readers that his natural history would be unlike any seen before. Describing natural history as a formative discipline for the development of a philosophy based on a more severe induction, he wrote, for neither Aristotle, nor Theophrastus, nor Dioscorides, nor Caius Plinius, ever set this before them as the end of natural history. 35 What did he mean by this? Scholars have often focused on the methodological aspects of Bacon's concept of induction at the expense of other intellectual issues. To understand Bacon's inductive science, we need to examine more carefully his reaction to late Renaissance natural history and the culture that produced it. We also need to consider the emergence of Bacon's ideas within their immediate political context, the death of Elizabeth I in 1603 and the accession of James I, a male monarch after some 50 years of female rule. As we shall see, Bacon's attack on the trivial link to historical critique of knowledge with an aesthetic commentary on Elizabethan court culture that had, in Bacon's analysis, feminized the leading minds of England, making them more receptive to aimless and unserious pursuits rather than solid and sober knowledge. 36. Despite Bacon's lack of specific references to contemporary natural histories, he offered a fairly detailed portrait of the state of Renaissance natural history which indicates that he understood the genre well. One of Bacon's most persistent criticisms of natural history was that it was indiscriminate. So in natural history, we see there hath not been that choice and judgment used as ought to have been, as may appear in the writings of Plinius, Cardanus, Albertus, and diverse of the Arabians, being fraught with much fabulous matter, a great part not only untried but notoriously untrue, to the great derogation of the credit of natural philosophy with the grave and sober kind of wits. 37. Natural history, as Bacon perceived it, had yet to fulfill its potential. In its current state, it was entertaining but untrustworthy knowledge. While the occult sciences impugn the status of natural philosophy through the grandiose and unrealized claims of their practitioner Sheer Bacon surely had contemporaries like D. and Bruno in mind as well as Paracelsus natural history trivialized science by giving itself over wholly to pleasure. Pleasure was in itself a female quality. And therefore knowledge that tendeth but to satisfaction is but as a courtesan, which is for pleasure and not for fruit or generation 38. 249. How had natural history, one of the most ancient scientific disciplines, gone so awry? In pondering this question, Bacon invoked history as a means of understanding how knowledge, when not set on its proper course, might become debased. History became a powerful tool in assessing the evolution of this form of knowledge, invoking an Edenic image of knowledge corrupted by humanity over time. Despite Bacon's stated aversion for mixing religion and philosophy, he argued that the fall was the original source of the debilitated state of natural history because it was in Adam's time that man had lost dominion over nature. 39 The antiquity of this field made its errors even more glaring since time only magnified these imperfections. Like many humanists before him, Bacon imagined his history of natural history as a dialogue with the past in which he interrogated the originators of the discipline on their intent and highlighted their shortcomings. As Bacon told Isaac K. Sabon in 1609, 
so I seem to have my conversation among the ancients more than among these with whom I live forty. This was undoubtedly a reflection of Bacon's difficulties in communicating with his contemporaries as well as a sign of his political astuteness dead were safe competitors who listened attentively and had no power to respond. To varying degrees, Bacon condemned both Aristotle and Pliny for neglecting to provide proper guidelines for this field. True, Aristotle offered a variety of skills that Bacon drew upon. Yet in each instance Bacon qualified his praise by condemning the result. Aristotle had offered a method for philosophizing but his emphasis on universals did not give particulars their due. He had written, Bacon acknowledged, so accurate a history of animals yet neglected to provide a criteria for evidence that measured up to Bacon's legalistic standards. Point 41 He had even given Bacon the inspiration for his own approach to past authors by generally refusing to mention them save to criticize them. Point 42 Yet in doing so Aristotle had set himself up as a tyrannical authority, becoming one of the idols that Bacon hoped to topple. Despite his many disagreements with his mentor Plato, Aristotle had not moved far enough away from his point of origin. Like Plato he created light philosophy that did not rigorously seek truth as its final goal, scraps of borrowed information polished and strung together 43. While admiring Aristotle's political skills that had won him the patronage of Alexander the Great, a feat Bacon hoped to emulate, the English natural philosopher discarded the vast majority of his natural history, tainted by its platonic origins and its predilection for syllogisms. Pliny offered Bacon a different set of problems. On the one hand, the Roman naturalist had recognized the importance and the scope of his discipline. In the advancement of learning, Bacon uncharacteristically halted his constant criticism of the ancients to praise Pliny as the only person who ever undertook a natural history according to the dignity of it, though he was far from carrying out his undertaking in a manner worthy of the conception 44. Bacon's kinship with Pliny lay in more than just the curious circumstances of their deaths. Both shared an encyclopedic and operative view of natural history. 250. Like Pliny, Bacon imagined natural history to cover all fields of knowledge. Pliny's decision to include such subjects as agriculture, the arts, and inventions in his natural history provided an important precondition to the third part of Bacon's natural history, things artificial. His emphasis on the little things in nature also appealed to Bacon's preference for the neglected and unglamorous aspects of natural history. Yet Pliny even more than Aristotle erred in his approach to natural history. Systematic in his collection of information, he was indiscriminate in his inclusion of every improbable tale of nature's wonders. Bacon's meditations upon the ancient creators of natural history led him to speculate about the historical evolution of this discipline. History was particularly important to him because he, like many younger Elizabethans, perceived his age to be crucially different from the past, the dawn of a new historical consciousness. 45 As Bacon observed, Aristotle's disdain for particulars and Pliny's preference for curiosities had had a long-lasting impact on natural history. Notwithstanding Pliny's diligent accumulation of information, his 20,000 noteworthy facts were the beginnings of a culture of natural history that had no consistent criteria of evidence. What few cautions Aristotle had offered about prioritizing information disappeared in Pliny's enthusiasm for quantity rather than quality. Anything and everything entered Pliny's natural history and very rarely did Pliny display skepticism regarding the veracity of these reports. The impact of Pliny's approach was made fully apparent in Bacon's assessment of Renaissance natural history. Nothing duly investigated, nothing verified, nothing counted, weighed, or measured, is to be found in natural history, and what in observation is loose and vague, is in information deceptive and treacherous. 46. Centuries of developing natural history as more of a literary than a scientific pursuit had rendered the desire to make it a repository of truth marginal to its construction. This was precisely why Bacon so despised the cultivation of curiosities. Bacon's history of natural history moved quickly from an exploration of ancient writings to a broad-based indictment of contemporary society. As he argued, the perilous moral state of society at the end of the century had brought natural history to a critical point in its uneasy development, 
it had become so tainted by current intellectual practices that it was on the verge of collapse. The culprits in the disintegration of knowledge were not the ancients per se nor even the excessive desire to imitate them, but the undue emphasis placed on wit in Renaissance culture. Wit became Bacon's primary nemesis, the source of all the trivial arts that he hoped to expunge from the pursuit of knowledge. Its importance in late Renaissance society and its historical validation by the ancients had given full rein to the powers of the imagination, rewarding philosophers who invented the most fantastic and elaborate systems of knowledge rather than those who approached the truth. In Bacon's opinion, this accounted for the popularity of many naturalists, philosophers, and magicians. Creators of pleasing genres, they had entertained the upper classes for centuries with their speculations. To signal how different his own work would be, Bacon announced. 251. The dawn of a new era, a birth of time rather than a birth of wit. 47. The historical consciousness of this new age not only made it critical of previous efforts to study nature but self-conscious of the limits of human ingenuity. Time provided a certain perspective which wit served to obscure. That perceived clarity of vision provided the basis from which Bacon launched a full-scale critique of Renaissance natural history. Optimistically he imagined Jacobean society as one not wholly given over to pleasure and excess and therefore an appropriate setting in which to reclaim nature from culture. Bacon's dislike of the current state of natural history stemmed particularly from the evolution of what William Ashworth has aptly dubbed the emblematic worldview 48. The humanist embellishments that expanded the scope of natural history in the late 16th and early 17th centuries certainly heightened the literary qualities of Pliny's discipline, they were central to the work of such well-known naturalists as Gessner, Aldrovandi, and their English imitators. Natural history had become an elaborate enterprise whose popularity derived not so much from its subject as its manner of presentation, in the process nature had been denatured. Bacon's goal entailed an absolute rejection of the highly rhetorical style of his contemporaries, the disciplining of language was one of the initial steps in the reclamation of nature. In a famous passage in his Preparative Towards a Natural and Experimental History, he declared, First then, away with antiquities, and citations of testimonies of authors, also with disputes and controversies and differing opinions, everything in short which is philological. Never cite an author except in a matter of doubtful credit, never introduce a controversy unless in a matter of great moment. And for all that concerns ornaments of speech, similitudes, treasure of eloquence, and such like emptinesses, let it be utterly dismissed. Point 49. Such sentiments were the logical culmination of Bacon's desire to reform the university curriculum so that rhetoric and logic would be taught after a sound introduction to natural philosophy rather than before as was traditionally done. Here and elsewhere Bacon attacked the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, arguing that the raw ingredients of nature rather than the language in which they were presented and the format in which they were debated formed the core of natural knowledge. Point 50 They were the core of the trivializing arts that Bacon hoped to eliminate from science precisely because they were the forum in which free license had been given to the imagination. Bacon's critique of the style of Renaissance natural history prefigured his dismissal of its content. As he was quick to observe, Natural history done for its own sake could be pleasing but it served no higher purpose. Once natural history became the foundation of natural philosophy, however, it no longer could exist in an undisciplined state. Purged of its vices, the ancient encyclopedia of nature seemed on the verge of collapse, supplanted by a new encyclopedia based on a new, more evidentiary definition of history. For I well know that a natural 252. History is extant, large in its bulk, pleasing in its variety, curious often in its diligence, but yet weeded of fables, antiquities, quotations, idle controversies, philology and ornaments. And it will shrink into a small compass. Certainly it is very different from that kind of history which I have in view. 51 In opposition to the humanist encyclopedists who saw the expansion of the literary content of natural history as their goal, Bacon instead proposed to separate the fictive aspects of this field of knowledge from its factual components. The remnants of the latter would form the core of his own natural history. 
in his discussion of the theoretical framework that informed Renaissance natural history, Bacon singled out two practices as particularly harmful to the search for truth, the desire to highlight nature's curiosities and the predilection for occult explanations. While Bacon considered a collection of monsters and other errors of nature a second division in his tripartite natural history essential to a proper natural history, he did not believe that this should include the phenomena that contemporaries, following Pliny, had called the jokes of nature, lusus naturi. Renaissance naturalists' predilection for lusus as an explanatory category for a wide range of difficult phenomena, from fossils to lodestones to snowflakes, struck Bacon as one of the most egregious examples of making the trivial important. For small varieties of this kind are only a kind of sports and wanton freaks of nature, and come near to the nature of individuals, he observed. They afford a pleasant recreation in wandering among them and looking at them as objects in themselves, but the information they yield to the sciences is slight and almost superfluous. Elsewhere he observed that they were of no serious use towards science 52. The lack of differentiation between play and science, in Bacon's view, led to the valorization of fantastic creatures such as the Scythian Lamba woolly zoophyte that allegedly survived by eating the grass around it. Instead Bacon called the vegetable lamb a fabulous notion, testimony to human ingenuity rather than the powers of observation. Point 53. Bacon's attack on the jokes of nature signaled the beginnings of a wholesale assault on any explanations that made the external appearance of nature a hieroglyph of some deeper and hidden meaning. He linked his criticisms to a moral indictment of intellectual pleasure, labeling the jokes of nature wanton and lascivious. 54. The moral turpitude of the encyclopedists became a general point of departure for his attack on any philosopher who sought to make nature obscure. In his thoughts and conclusions, for example, Bacon chastised those who made a cult of the incomprehensibility of nature 55. The Paracelsian doctrine of signatures, which Bacon singled out for particular scorn, embodied all the problems of this approach to nature. Its elaborate system of occult correspondences that made all resemblance meaningful not only confused the natural and the divine, two categories Bacon hoped to separate, but also conflated real relationships among the different parts of nature with false connections. Summing up his disgust with Paracelsian natural philosophy, Bacon wrote, It is we who deserve pity for spending our time in the midst of such distasteful trivialities. 56. 253. For Bacon, the ideas of Paracelsus and their elaboration in the work of disciples such as Oswald Kral signaled the beginning of an expanded discourse about nature that exemplified the full degeneration of learning over time. Bacon's ambivalence about the ancient Swo, however misguided they were, were nonetheless the originators of human knowledge stands in marked contrast to his wholesale attack on foreign natural philosophers who had contributed to symbolic approaches to nature in the preceding century. With the exception of a few criticisms of Gilbert, who had died by the time Bacon began to publish his work, he was noticeably and prudently silent about the English. Rather than mentioning figures such as D. and Moffett men with whom he surely had some contact in and around London Bacon used his detailed critiques of foreign philosophers to air his concerns about the direction of intellectual life in England. While Plato had at least refined the art of conversation, Bacon felt that his Renaissance counterparts offered no such skills. Agrippa was a trivial buffoon whose initial praise of the occult sciences and his subsequent condemnation of them only highlighted how little he knew. Telesio, Fray Castro, Bruno, and Gilbert were all writers of comedies, a term Bacon frequently used to signify the inconsequentiality of a given philosophy. Cardinot was a spider weaving his webs in which to capture innocent readers, unaware of how little the ideas in his unsubtlety, 1550, and on the variety of things, 1557, owed to nature. 57 The very images of nature summoned forth in Cardinaux's titles became watchwords in Bacon's critique of learning. In the advancement of learning Bacon characterized contemporary knowledge as subtle, idle, unwholesome, linking Cardinaux's philosophy with leisurely pursuits and moral corruption. In the Novum Organum he criticized naturalists for their great and indeed over-curious diligence in observing the variety of things. 
58 The addition of yet another subtle phenomenon or one more account of variety in the Encyclopedia of Nature moved natural history further away from its proper but heretofore unrecognized goal, the building of natural philosophy. Instead Bacon proposed a natural history that would describe the fundamental properties of nature, which is surely why he picked such subjects as hot and cold, winds and sound in his list of proposed natural histories. Bacon's distaste for contemporary natural history stemmed from a broader dislike of what Patricia Fumerton has called the trivial selfhood of the aristocracy in the English Renaissance. From this vantage point, nature had become one of the many devices through which elites expressed their identity, weaving elaborate natural imagery into their clothes, banquets, and masks, and privileging exotic Athe curiosities that Bacon so despised as a form of cultural capital. Trivial arts saturate this world with the pretty clutter of the fragmentary, peripheral, and ornamental, writes Fumerton.59 Thus Bacon's critique of variety had an additional layer of meaning. In an age in which the court physician Thomas Moffat could devote an entire poem to the silkworm and Ovid's metamorphoses could be served up as dessert, natural history was much more an 254. Extension of culture rather than nature, as Bacon stated in his description of the intellectual globe, it was indeed exquisite knowledge. 60. The last decades of the 16th century made this frivolous taste for nature materially apparent as some of the early financiers of English forays abroad began to accrue queer foreign objects like the ones Thomas Platter found in Sir Walter Cope's home in London in 1599, Cope not coincidentally was a good friend of Bacon's cousin Cecil.61 The cabinets of curiosities created by English aristocrats were, in Bacon's view, the ultimate trivialization of natural history, turning natural objects into ornaments that enhanced one's social standing but did not further knowledge, what Bacon described as the most splendid costly. Bacon imagined this approach to nature as the product of prolonged female rule, Lacking a firm leadership it was no wonder that natural history, like English society, indulges to excess in matters superfluous. The feminization of knowledge also accounted for the current distaste for the ordinary and ignoble parts of nature, such fastidiousness being merely childish and effeminate 62. Much to Bacon's dismay the abuse of nature's material wealth only accelerated under the reign of James I. In 1625 we find John Tradescant the Elder writing to the Secretary of the Navy to request, on behalf of the Duke of Buckingham, anything that is strang 63. As Bacon would have argued, so great was the power of female rule and so seductive was the delight in the trivial that even the arrival of a male monarch could not quickly dissipate its influence. In a famous letter of advice written to Buckingham in 1616, Bacon pronounced, let the vanity of the times be restrained. While masks and revels the very medium in which Bacon had initially presented his ideas to the Elizabethan court in the 1590s were appropriate for a queen's court, he argued kings needed recreation of a more manly and useful deportment 64. As we know, Bacon was unsuccessful in his plea to make the Jacobean court less enamored of the trivial pursuits that had flourished under Elizabeth, the Earl of Arundel to whom Bacon directed his last letter was surely the greatest collector of paintings and curiosities in his day. Herein lay the failure of Bacon's carefully laid plans, conceived in the final decade of Elizabeth's rule when many of the younger generation of courtiers were hopeful about what the arrival of a new monarch might bring. Despite James I's initial revulsion at the public extravagances of Elizabethan ceremonial, the number of masks increased, virtuoso culture thrived and, as a result, nature became even more curious. Point 65. Sober pursuits. Natural history is not meant to be pleasant, declared Bacon, in what was probably his most succinct and humorous statement of his philosophy. Point 66. Bacon's attempts to tame natural history were indeed a direct response to the place of science in Elizabethan England. On the one hand, the utility of natural knowledge had become apparent by the late 16th century as the English Venn. 255. Toured further and further away from their own shores, fulfilling Bacon's vision of the naturalist explorer, a new Columbus who circled the globe in search of knowledge. On the other hand, 
neither the Elizabethan nor the Jacobean aristocrats to whom Bacon addressed his work saw the increased importance of natural history in their mercantile adventures as a reason to discard the courtly uses of nature that enhanced the humanist tradition of natural history. As a result, few of Bacon's contemporaries were sympathetic to the radical reformation of knowledge that he proposed. Even the universities seemed to have been reluctant to accept his offer to revise their curriculum. Despite the lack of encouragement Bacon persisted in his work to the end of his life, neither political disgrace nor intellectual isolation convinced him that the English monarch and his favorites would be unreceptive to his ideas. In concluding this examination of Bacon's attitude towards natural history, we should ask ourselves what the origins were of his commitment to the sober and disciplined pursuit of knowledge. First, we need to consider Bacon's social position. A member of the House of Commons who appeared on Elizabeth's lists of New Year's gift givers as a gentleman, Bacon did not belong to the highest stratum of society but to the level below it. Not until after Elizabeth's death was he knighted, in 1603, the series of preferments that James offered him from then until his impeachment for accepting bribes in 1621 were never enough to compensate for his perceived sense of inferiority by the rules of the court. Certainly this alone and the burdens of being the younger and unexpectedly impoverished son of the Lord Keeper of the Seal might have led Bacon to exhibit what his biographer Raleigh called a gravity and maturity above his years. 67. Bacon's religious upbringing surely played an important role in his attitude towards nature. While rejecting his mother's Puritanism, Bacon nonetheless approached nature as a second scripture. Mishandling this book of God was akin to blasphemy if not heresy, the philosophers who spun fanciful tales had been possessed by the devil and therefore needed an exorcist. Describing himself as a more cautious purveyor of nature's facts, Bacon wrote, I interpose everywhere admonitions and scruples and cautions, with a religious care to eject, repress, and as it were exorcise every kind of phantasm 68. This attitude mirrored well Bacon's distaste for enthusiasm of any kind which was, in its origin, a religious principle. Thus the severe and original inquisition of knowledge arose not simply from Bacon's legalistic standards of evidence but more deeply from his conviction that nature like scripture could yield one truth. W. He raced to find the real truth requireth another manner of severity, he wrote in the Advancement of Learning.69. The extent to which Bacon described the gathering of disciples as a conversion experience and the disciplining of their minds as a rite of initiation suggests that the model for his scientific community lay somewhere between a reformed religious order and an ideal polity, an apt image for an Elizabethan discontent with the yoke of female rule. You know I am no courtier, wrote Bacon in his 1616 letter to Buckingham and, in a sense, this was true since he 256. Seems to have been profoundly uncomfortable with many aspects of court life, most notably its delight in the fragmentary. 70. His philosophy, he wrote, teaches the people to assemble and unite and take upon them the yoke of laws and submit to authority, and forget their ungoverned appetites. 71. The restoration of order lay at the heart of Bacon's program, and this was precisely why knowledge and the knowledge making community needed to be disciplined. How else could one create fit assistance? 72 Throughout his works Bacon mixed political and religious metaphors, portraying himself both as a priest of nature and as one of the faithful secretaries in the cabinet of knowledge whose civic task was to record the laws of nature. 73 What has not been fully understood is the extent to which these images were directed at James I who also enjoyed the image of himself as Solomon well before Bacon publicized it in his writings. With James lay the hope that natural history and therefore natural philosophy might amount to something. James alone did not provide the impetus for Bacon's ideas, which were formed at least a decade before he ascended to the English throne, but he was certainly the reason that Bacon could announce with greater confidence after 1603, it is time. 74. As is well known, Bacon's disciplining of natural history had little immediate effect. Not until the 1640s did natural philosophers take up his call and not until the 1660s, with the inauguration of the Royal Society and the crowning of Bacon as the society's intellectual father, did Baconianism find an institutional niche in early modern scientific culture. 75 From this perspective, 
we might just leave you Bacon's original program to be of short-lived and somewhat isolated duration since the Royal Society cared not a whit for the intricacies of Elizabethan and Jacobean politics. Yet I nonetheless think that we need to take Bacon's program of reform seriously because it offered such a powerful model for the creation of disciplines in the 17th and 18th centuries. The process by which Bacon reinvented natural history became a template for the history of such disciplines as philosophy, physics, and chemistry, for as natural philosophy ceased to be the rubric under which all these forms of inquiry were subsumed, it was the story of the discipline itself that remained. We may never fully understand why Bacon chose natural history as the first subject upon which to enact this process, as I have suggested throughout this essay, most likely its unusual position between the universities and the court, between natural philosophy and natural magic, between the old forms of knowledge and the new, made it a particularly attractive choice. In the course of the 17th century natural history was to become the dominant discipline in the pursuit of scientific knowledge, every major academy, from the Academia Dei Lincei to the Royal Society to the Paris Academy of Sciences, and many minor ones made natural history their common project, implicitly confirming Bacon's choice of subject. Point 76 In doing so, they also revised the structure of natural history, inspired by the power of this discipline as a framework for new and empirical knowledge. 261. From Apotheosis to Analysis. Some Late Renaissance Histories of Classical Astronomy. Anthony Grafton. At the end of March 1609 Johannes Kepler finished writing his Astronomia Nova. On the title page he inscribed a short quotation from the Scholi Mathematici of Petrus Ramus. There Ramus had proposed a reform of astronomy a reform based on a polemical history of the exact sciences. He argued that the wise priests of ancient Egypt and Babylon had created an infallible astronomy by devoting themselves to direct observation of the stars and precise recording of the results. They devised no hypotheses and constructed no geometrical models of the movement of the planets. By doing so, they created an astronomy which enabled them to predict the positions of stars and planets at any given point, precisely and effortlessly. Unfortunately, Ramus explained, the Greeks and Romans had conquered the East and appropriated the results of Eastern science. Worse still, they had transformed these, making the lucid, simple, and exact empirical astronomy of the priests on their pyramids into a chaotic, complicated and imperfect science. Ramus identified Hipparchus and Ptolemy as the chief sinners. They had devised a geometrical method, according to which a set of imaginary crystalline spheres, revolving at set rates, generated the motion of each planet. The models they created were sophisticated but their search for a geometrical world system that consisted entirely of spheres and would enable them to predict planetary motions necessarily ended in failure. Unlike the Near Eastern priests, they did not collect the vast amounts of precise data needed to give their science a foundation. Their effort to develop models distracted them from their proper job. These problems, Ramus argued, had long been evident. As early as the 5th century AD, Proclus revealed significant gaps and contradictions in classical astronomy. Nonetheless, astronomers in Islam and the West continued to insist, over the centuries, on developing their science in the geometrical manner first imposed on it by the Greeks. Copernicus went so far as to speculate as to whether the sun stood still and the earth moved with the other planets saw hypothesis that Ramus found completely bizarre. Ramus promised the scholar who succeeded in reconstructing the ancient astronomy without hypotheses a chair at the College du Roi in Paris, the innovative institution, dedicated to mathematics and the humanities, where he taught. 1. 262. Kepler commented on this passage scornfully and in some detail. He himself, he claimed, deserved the promised chair, on the basis of the discoveries he had just made about the motion of the planets. But there was no danger that he would make this claim good, for Ramus had died as one of the victims of the massacre of St. Bartholomew's in 1572. Kepler, however, also took the trouble to set out a counter-history of astronomy which suggests that he took a serious view of Ramus's influence, if not of his ideas. Copernicus, 
Kepler argued, devised no hypotheses, he simply described the world, in the conviction that he had discovered the truth. But the Nuremberg theologian Andreas Oziander, who saw the Derevolutionibus through the press, disagreed. He added an anonymous foreword in which he described the Copernican system as a hypothesis, hoping in this way to remove any suspicion of heresy from the book. In a copy of De Revolutionibus bearing manuscript annotations by Hieronymus Schreiber, Kepler found the proof for his assertion that Oziander wrote the anonymous preface. Two then he went on to argue for the truth of Copernicanism. In any case, he pointed out, a reformation of astronomy must rest not only on the collection of all relevant data, but also on the continued application of the methods of Greek mathematics. Kepler revealed that Ramus's history of science, which traced the decline and fall of astronomy, had no solid basis. He himself, rather than the Egyptian priests, was the first astronomer who had the right to claim that he had developed an astronomy without hypotheses. Astronomy, more generally, did not decline, but developed slowly over time, and even Ramus could not prevent this progress from continuing in the future. More than ten years ago Nicholas Jardine rightly pointed out the originality and elegance of Kepler's historical work, showing that he combined considerable detective gifts as a researcher with massive intelligence as an interpreter of texts. Kepler, he argued, founded modern history of science as well as modern astronomy. Earlier scholars had, on the whole, traced this history in celebratory rather than analytical contexts, for example, in inaugural lectures at the outset of university courses on astronomy. Following well-established tradition, they had generally confined themselves to telling stories about Thales and his well or his monopoly on olive presses or to sending up a cloud of fine adjectives and metaphors. The point of such texts, after all, lay not in reconstructing the history of astronomy as it really was, but in offering legitimation for its study in the present, by providing it with the splendid genealogy that conferred social and cultural status in the Renaissance. Point three, Ramus's theory mattered chiefly because it helped provoke Kepler to develop his counter arguments. Point four, Jardine was certainly right to argue that Kepler studied the history of astronomy in a profound and original way. In fact, however, his predecessors and opponents reached suggestive results as well. Even Ramus' wildest speculations rested in part on an original reading of ancient sources, which he owed in part to a gifted astronomer. Point five, and even Kepler's most critical analyses rested in part on researches carried out by an astrologer and natural philosopher widely regarded as eccentric or even mad. Remarkably enough, the astronomer and the 263 natural philosopher knew each other, corresponded, met, became friends and then became enemies. The present essay traces the history of their friendship, the development of their two histories of astronomy and astrology, and the impact of both on Kepler. Redicus and Cardinal. Kepler named both of his protagonists in the Astronomia Nova. The astronomer, George Joachim Redicus, 1514-1576, he characterized as an erudite madman. Six true. Redicus had brought Copernicus's thesis to the attention of the public for the first time with a text that Kepler respected and even reprinted, the Narratio Prima. Later, however, he tried to determine the movements of Mars. Kepler, proud of his own success in this notoriously difficult enterprise, mercilessly ridiculed his predecessor's effort to solve this technical problem with magical help. Once, when Redicus found himself stuck fast in his observation of Mars, and could see no way out, he took refuge in consulting the oracle of his guiding spirit, perhaps in the intention of sounding its wisdom, in God's name, perhaps out of helpless longing for the truth. The irritable protector seized the troublesome researcher by the hair, smashed him against the ceiling above and then dropped him, so that his body fell to the floor. He then gave his oracular verdict that is the motion of Mars 7. Perhaps Kepler exaggerated or invented this account. Nonetheless Redicus certainly did take an interest in various forms of magic as well as astronomy and mathematics. The eccentric natural philosopher, by contrast, Kepler described as a gifted mathematician. In fact, 
he consistently cited the mathematical work of the Italian physician, astrologer, and philosopher Girolamo Cardano, 1501-1576, as profound and authoritative. Given Kepler's intolerance for Redicus's eccentricities, this tolerant attitude occasions mild surprise. Cardinot was and remains widely known for his efforts to preserve and continue the traditions of astrology and natural magic developed in 15th century Italy. He dedicated himself to close study of such absorbing subjects as the magical properties of human fat. An Italian who lived through the years in which the Counter-Reformation gradually took hold and the intellectual climate of the peninsula became chillier and chillier, he nonetheless drew up a horoscope for his Sousa venture that brought the Inquisition down upon him and cost him a long period of house arrest in Rome at the end of his life. Cardinot's analysis of his own horoscope revealed the weaknesses of his character so vividly and immodestly that his 17th-century reader Gabriel Node, himself no model of Attic brevity or prudence, condemned him for bringing himself into universal discredit. Point eight. The most serious attack on Cardinot's status as a natural philosopher, moreover, 264, took place long before Kepler wrote, and he knew the results very well. In 1557 Julius Caesar Scaliger devoted more than 900 pages to revealing some of the mistakes in Cardinot's popular book De Subtilitate. These exercitations, in turn, became a set book on natural philosophy in German universities, and belonged to the young Kepler's favorite reading matter. Nine in the 1620s he admitted that he had been carried away, as a young man, by his enthusiasm for Scaliger's speculations. Point 10 Despite Kepler's admiration for Scaliger's sharp style, rigorous method, and bold philosophy, he also recognized Cardinot's superiority as a mathematician, an area in which Scaliger lacked solid competence. Eventually, as we will see, Kepler also came to take Cardinot seriously as a guide to the historical development of ancient science. Cardinot and Redicus came into contact between 1538 and 1543. Cardinot was preparing a second, improved edition of his astrological works, the Libelli Duo. Already in the first edition of 1538 he had drawn up and commented on ten horoscopes in order to ground his astrological principles on examples. He now needed further materials. The Nuremberg publisher Johannes Petrius proposed to publish Cardinot's Latin works, with additional matter if possible. Redicus collaborated with Petrius in the publication of Copernicus, for example. At some point he sent the Italian astrologer four horoscopes for the new edition.11. The two men's shared interest in astrological history may well have brought them together. In his Supplementum Almanac of 1538, Cardinot argued that the movements of the sphere of the fixed stars determined the fates of cities and kingdoms. The head of Algal, for example, had spent 400 years above Greece and Asia, and caused the destruction of these lands by the Muslims. Now it hovered over Apulia and Naples, threatening Italy. By contrast, the star of the second magnitude at the end of the tail of Ursa Major had been over Rome at the time of the city's founding, and accounted for the martial temperament of the Roman people. Point 12 Redicus, for his part, loved such schemata. He believed in the 1540s that the Copernican system contained a solution to the riddles of world history as well as those of astronomy. Fifteen years later, he would propose an astrological system quite like Cardinot's in a dedicatory letter to the Emperor Ferdinand 2.13. In any event, Cardinot himself publicized his collaboration with the Protestant astronomer. In commenting on the horoscope of Savonarola that figured, with 66 others, in Petrius's 1543 edition of his Libelli, he wrote enthusiastically, who could describe more precisely what actually took place? One might be tempted to believe that this was made up, if my friend George Joachim had not sent me these last four horoscopes after I finished my little book. I saw to it that they were added fourteen. The four horoscopes in question stated the birth times, characters and fates of Savonarola, Pico della Mirandola, George Pierbach, and Albrecht Dürer. Clearly Cardinot assumed that Redicus had reliable information about Florence as well as Nuremberg, in fact, the intellectual networks that connected the two cities buzzed with messages. 
265. In the mid-1540s the correspondence met. Redicus made the obligatory trip to Italy and visited Cardinal, no later than March 1547, in Milan. In the third edition of his Supplementum and in his Aphorismi Astronomici Cardinal reported in detail on their discussions. They tried to place the rules of astrology on a firmer basis. According to Cardinal, their conversations rather resembled those of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Twice in the Aphorismi dialogues between Cardinal and Redicus appear. According to Cardinal, the German astrologer offered his Italian friend horoscopes to interpret. Cardinal realized immediately that the first subject, a man, suffered from melancholy and worked as a counterfeiter, he foresaw an execution in the near future. The second subject, a woman, he diagnosed with equal rapidity as a witch and confidence woman, though he could not determine her ultimate fate precisely. In both cases Cardinal portrays Redicus as suffused with astonishment and admiration, on de hoc, how could you know that, he asked, jaw-dropping almost audibly and so gave the cue for a detailed account of Cardinal's methods. 15 Redicus also gave his friend another group of celebrity horoscopes, including those of Regio Montanus, V.E.S. Aleus, Agrippa, Poliziano, and Oziander. Cardinal printed these and discussed them in the third edition of the Supplementum. The birth dates of any number of famous men, as found in modern reference works, rest on no older and more reliable source than this horoscope collection. Cardinal's astrological collaboration with Redicus paradoxically contributed more than a mite to the development of modern history. 16. Cardinal's name does not appear in Redicus's letters until the middle of the 1550s. In his 1554 commentary on Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, the one surviving ancient textbook of astrology, Cardinal made fun of the superfluous complications that the German astronomer Regio Montanus had introduced into his tables, in order Cardinal claimed to enslave subsequent astronomers. 17 In doing so he continued a polemic that he had begun as early as 1547, when he charged in his commentary on Regio Montanus's horoscope that the German had plagiarized Bianchini and others. 18 Redicus now allowed himself. One dry remark, Cardini Cardino sunt similima 19. This single comment on an intellectually ambitious text of more than 300 pages suffices to show that the relation between the two men had cooled off. The preserved documents do not explain why their friendship came to an end. Perhaps Redicus was wounded by the role Cardinal assigned him in his dialogues, perhaps the comments on Regio Montanus which provoked his one explicit remark made him genuinely angry. At all events, they were never reconciled. In the 1560s Redicus encouraged another astrologer and natural philosopher, Tadas Haig, to compete with Cardinal in the development of a system of physiognomics. The Italian, he now declared bitterly, claimed that he had mastered all the mysteries of facial interpretation, but his boasts were empty. Point twenty. The erstwhile collaborators and friends were now open enemies. It will become evident that they not only came to dislike one another, but also took radically different positions on issues that mattered very much to both of them. 266. Two genealogies. Originally, Redicus and Cardinot began from the same historical premises. In his treatise De Temporum et Motuum Eraticarum Restitution Cardinot argued that the astronomy of Thales, the earliest Greek philosopher, came from Egyptian sources. 21 In the Aphorismi Astronomici he suggested that Ptolemy had continued an ancient tradition that derived from the Near East, the difference between Ptolemy's precepts and those of all later writers is greater than that between emeralds and mud. Probably he possessed the wonderful texts of the Chaldeans and Babylonians, from many centuries before, and those of the Egyptians 22. An anonymous reader of Cardinot's book underlined the last sentence forcefully in a copy of the book preserved in the British Library, 53b7. Redicus's thoughts moved in the same direction, but with greater speed and force. In April 1551 he fell under suspicion of having raped a student. Instead of defending himself before the university court in Leipzig, he fled to Prague, and then to Krakow. Here he became a doctor, 
taking a special interest in the Paracelsian philosophy of nature. His fascination with the development of astronomy never left him, but it now took a surprising turn. For 15 years Reticus had ruminated over how to rebuild classical astronomy. He believed firmly that the positions of the fixed stars in Ptolemy's list were often wrong, and that these errors in turn explained other ones in Greek astronomy. Point 23 Suddenly he realized that the ancient Egyptians must have possessed exactly the knowledge modern Europeans needed and lacked, and that he himself was in an ideal position to reconstruct it. In his Natural History the Elder Pliny described the making, transportation, and purpose of the obelisks of ancient Egypt. He held that the Egyptians had dedicated these shafts to the sun god, the word obelisk, indeed, also meant Sunday 24. A few inferences more and Reticus was on the move. Pliny bears witness that the obelisks were dedicated to the sun god. The sun is also queen and ruler of the heavenly state, all other stars move in accordance with her rhythm. She is the eye of the world, whose light illuminates everything. Obelisks alone make it possible to observe and record all the laws of the heavenly state. Obelisks alone will open experts' eyes and give them the light they need to record the observations required for the history of the planetary motions and to seek out the proofs needed to determine the motions, enabling them to make useful observations of the planetary motions at all times. Point 25. Reticus ridiculed the pathetic astronomical instruments of the Greeks, armillary spheres, rules, astrolabes, and quadrants are human inventions, which require great effort from their users and offer no defense against error 26. In sharp contrast with these comic pieces of apparatus stood the obelisk, the simplicity of which mirrored its divine origins and absolute infallibility. The obelisk was erected by divine instruction and easily provides all of this. We have shown in detail that the obelisk is a product of philosophy, which 267 reveals a method for establishing the positions of the sun, the moon, the planets, and other stars. From these the regular motions of the stars and all the laws of the heavenly state can be determined. Thus astronomy, geography, and the part of physics which deals with the effects of the stars, a discipline most important for human life, can be constructed, reinforced, and propagated. 27. Reticus's interpretation of Pliny swarms with problems. Pliny believed that the Egyptians dedicated their obelisks to the sun god. Moreover, he said that the inscriptions on the obelisks in the Roman campus Martius and Circus Maximus contained an interpretation of nature according to the Egyptian philosophy 28. But he nowhere stated, explicitly or implicitly, that the pillars themselves functioned as astronomical instruments. Perhaps Reticus thought that he had other evidence to support his thesis. For example, he could have based his theory on the passage in which Pliny described the meridian instrument set up by Augustus in the Campus Martius. The Egyptian obelisk that Augustus had brought to Rome played the central role of a gnomon in this apparatus. But by Pliny's account, the Romans who brought the obelisk to Rome, not the Egyptians who first hewed it from the rock, were the ones who thought of using it in this way. Nothing in Pliny's description directly suggests that Augustus saw himself as imitating Egyptian precedents. 29 In the end, Pliny's text contains no solid reason to think that obelisks were Egyptian observatories. Perhaps Reticus's search for financial support led him to leap, like a skater on cracking ice, from shaky evidence towards a striking conclusion. In the second half of the 16th century, a number of imperial princes competed to develop programs of astronomical innovation. They invited astronomers and craftsmen to develop more and more splendid and effective instruments, which served as both scientific and political instruments. More than one princely astronomer made important observations. William IV of Hesse Castle recorded the movements of the comet of 1572 so precisely, according to Bruce Moran, that he felt able to debate the comet's path and nature with Tycho Ubra. 30 Reticus's plan, with its call for the erection of a rare, costly instrument and its evocation of the big science of Augustus and the pharaohs, may have been calculated to catch some particular princely eye. Reticus deeply regretted that astronomers had ceased to use this perfect instrument. Some obelisks languished in captivity under the Turkish despot in Constantinople, 
where this treasure serves no purpose except his vanity. 31. The Roman obelisk of Augustus had ceased to yield observations centuries before. But help was on the way. In Krakow, Redicus had found a patron, who paid for him to set up an obelisk, 45 Roman feet high 32. The Lutheran astronomer became, in his own eyes, the last in the great line of Egyptian priests. In summer 1554, Redicus described his obelisk and his plans for a new astronomy in a letter to Johannes Kruto, to whom he confided that with God's help I hope to use my obelisk to make new measurements of the entire sphere of the fixed stars 33. Seven years later, Kruto persuaded a student of Ramus's, Jacques Calanay, to visit Redicus. He found both the astronomer and the obelisk. 268. Fascinating. After Calanay returned to Paris, in fact, he managed to convince Ramus to invite Redicus to Paris. In a letter of August 17, 1563 he described Ramus's plans to see to it that Redicus received a chair in the college du ROI. 34 Eight days later Ramus sent the letter which Kepler would later cite, in which he praised the German astronomer's writings and accomplishments. He also pointed out the pressing need for a reformation in astronomy, as to the form of astronomy I wanted to create, I could find to real aids either in logic or in books or among men when I considered how this subject has become so difficult and been thrown into such confusion by those hypotheses. Redicus's obelisk impressed Ramus as just the right instrument for developing a kind of astrology which is entirely set free not only from the efforts required by the devices of Pythagoras and Jabir, but also from those many hundreds of tables 35. The enthusiasm with which Ramus received and adopted Redicus's theory reflects, in part at least, his reading of other texts, one of which he ascribed to the same author. In arguing that Copernicus had gone wrong, like his forerunners, by devising wild hypotheses, Ramus drew on the anonymous preface to De Revolutionibus. This argued, as we have seen, that Copernicus meant only to propose a hypothesis, not what he considered a true system of the world. Ramus's letter shows that he thought Redicus, not Oziander, had written this disclaimer, your letter if I am not mistaken which serves as the preface to Copernicus shows that the hypotheses regarding Epicycles and eccentrics are false and ridiculous inventions 36. Though the young Redicus had revered Copernicus as his teacher and agreed with him, Ramus imagined that he had subtly tried to distance himself both from the Copernican theory and its Ptolemaic forerunner. Only this productive misunderstanding enabled him to draw from Redicus's obelisk project the general conclusion that he rejected all hypothesis and interpretation based on a false assumption which Redicus, for reasons of his own, did not correct. But the fuller set of historical and astronomical theories that Ramus connected with Redicus's enterprise drew on other, late antique sources as well sources that reflected the serious effort of scholars to probe the defects of their system of the world. Proclus had argued, in his commentary on the Timaeus, that Plato applied no astronomical hypotheses. In his hypotyposis he had gone further, claiming that the Greek philosophers had feared that they might find the movement of the stars irrational, undefined, and irregular. They even feared that the heavens might collapse and dissolve. Therefore the most important astronomers developed the hypotheses, which assumed a reasonable, regular rhythm, which obeyed definite, ordered and identical causes. They hoped in this way to defend and support the eternal order of the heavens. 37. Simplicius, finally, offered a vital clue in his commentary on Aristotle's De Saello. There he quoted a passage from Porphyry, according to which Callus thence, who had accompanied Alexander the Great to Babylon, sent the astronomical observations of the Chaldeans, which he found in the conquered city, back to 269. Greece. 38. Unfortunately, these pure data, which had not been forced into the distorting mold of a hypothesis, never arrived. Instead, the Greek astronomers from Eudacus to Aristotle, developed a series of increasingly elaborate geometrical models, which Simplicius discussed in detail, drawing on the lost history of mathematics by Eudemus. Even these earliest models, Ramus held, suffered from their hypothetical character. 
but they were simpler, and therefore better, than the more complex ones devised by later astronomers. Above all, Ramus claimed, drawing on Aristotle as well as Proclus, the Pythagoreans were at fault, since they had rejected concentric motions and invented Epicycles and eccentrics 39. Ramus's history of the mathematical sciences rested on energetic study of a wide range of texts. It formed the context within which he encouraged Rheticus to develop an astronomy assigned hypothesibus and reproached the Greeks for ruining astrology with their complex models. And it explains why, though Ramus knew Rheticus's obelisk only from the image of it printed on Rheticus' canon, this inspired him with the conviction that he now had the key that could unlock the mysteries of history and astronomy alike. Years later, meeting Tycho in Strasbourg, Ramus tried to convince him that the Egyptian astronomers had possessed a perfectly empirical astronomy. 40. Ramus influenced Rheticus in his turn. As early as 1551, Rheticus printed what he claimed to be Copernicus's theory that the weaknesses of modern astronomy derived in large part from the lacunae and errors in its ancient sources. The Greek astronomers, who should have based their theories on the data, in fact did the reverse, and preserved only those observations which supported their models. Ptolemy's data in particular deserved little credence. Only a program of systematic observation, designed to test and verify the transmitted ancient materials, could restore modern astronomy. No wonder that Rheticus came to suspect that Ptolemy might have done serious harm to astronomy. 41 in a fragmentarily preserved letter to Ramus of 1568, Rheticus proposed again to restore the astronomy of the first creators of this science. He now appropriated Ramus's terminology. Instead of simply emphasizing the virtues of the obelisk as an observational tool, he insisted on the theoretical necessity of redeeming astronomy as a whole from its original sin of hypothesis framing, I will now set to work on the project that occurred to you as well, to free the art of astronomy from hypothesis, contenting myself with the observations alone. 42. Perhaps Rheticus still hoped for a call to Paris. In any event, this time the outside offer did not come. As to Rheticus's obelisk in Krakow and the data he compiled using it, both seem to have vanished without trace. Cardinot also found obelisks enchanting. In his De Rerum Varietate of 1557 he described in some detail the Vatican obelisk, which was one of Rome's wonders, and the still more astonishing one which the Emperor Constantine had transported from Egypt to Constantinople. But he presented them only as imposing pieces of stonework, not as scientific instruments, they were no more and no less scientific than the Forum of Hadrian, which he also described. 43 and the same relatively calm attitude towards Egyptian achievements that 270 manifested itself in this passage also appeared in his more technical astronomical and astrological works of the same period. At the beginning of Cardinot's career, as we saw, he believed firmly in the Near Eastern origins of Greek science. In his De Temporum et Motuum Eraticarum Restitution Libellus of 1543, for example, he argued that the Jews had developed a lunar calendar before the flood, and that the Egyptians had devised a solar year shortly afterwards. 44 The Greek astronomers, Eudacus and Hipparchus, came later and imitated the methods of the Egyptians. Cardinal portrayed matters in the same way in his short Encomium Astrologiae, which appeared in the same collection. He called Moses the first astronomer, because he used the equinoxes and new moons to set the dates of holidays for the Jewish people. And he praised the later astronomical achievements of the Egyptian Hermes Trismegistus and the Chaldean Berisus. 45 For the most part, the encomium followed the doxographic approach and exhibited the enthusiastic style normal for the genre to which it belonged. Already in this early work, however, Cardinot showed that he did not share his German friend's Egyptomania. His encomium treated astronomy as an art that developed over time. He evoked a golden chain of astronomical learning, which extended chronologically and geographically from Israel to Italy, over Ethiopia, Egypt, Africa, Babylon, Phoenicia, and Greece. Apparently, he saw the later astronomers as perfectly competent. 
At one point he even remarked that Greeks, Egyptians, and Phoenicians, in that order, studied the heavens more curiously than the Jews a tactful but unmistakable effort to correct the widely held belief that astronomy had declined over time. Point 46. In his commentary on Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, which appeared in 1554, Cardinot made a more systematic effort than before to reconstruct the early development of a Greek science, astrology. He began by suggesting a historical analogy. Hippocrates, the founder of Greek medicine, developed a sophisticated set of medical theories, with which Cardinot came into contact as early as the 1520s, when Fabio Calvo printed both the first full Latin translation and the Greek texts of his works. 47 The Hippocratic Method, though speculative in its conclusions, seemed entirely empirical in its foundations. For Hippocrates derived the components of his system from direct observation, in large part, from case histories of the sort that he had recorded in the epidemics. The modern medical man who, like Cardinot, wished to enlarge and improve Greek medicine, must do so on the basis of its originally empirical method. The modern astrologer, Cardinot argued, should work in the same way just as his ancient counterparts had. He assumed that Ptolemy had had at his disposal a collection of examples, a series of horoscopes. These he drew from now lost texts, perhaps those of the Egyptians and Chaldeans. They provided the empirical basis of Ptolemy's astrology. 48 Cardinot held that he could reconstruct this lost body of empirical data by a combination of philological and astrological research. His argument forms a rich mixture of precise textual interpretation and bold historical speculation. 271. Cardinot drew on many texts, taking account of the historical background as well as of the preserved astrological sources. Reading the Roman historians, above all Suetonius and Tacitus, he produced a list of the astrologers who had worked in the Roman imperial court just before and during Ptolemy's time. He also portrayed, with admiration, their scientific and political accomplishments, assuming that those described as Chaldeans really came from the Near East. 49 And he boldly conjectured that these professionals had supplied Ptolemy with his data. Taking as his occasion a passage in which Ptolemy discussed Egyptian medicine, Cardinot summarized his theory. When Ptolemy says that the Egyptians developed this art, he means not only them, but also the neighboring peoples, for example the Chaldeans. Suetonius describes in his life of Nero how they prophesied both his rule and his murder of his mother. When the mother learned of this, she said simply Oxidat cum imperet. One of these men was Thrasyllus, who predicted the rule of Tiberius during his exile and enjoyed enormous authority. Asclatarian, who lived under Diocletian, was less successful. It seems, then, as though the art of the Chaldeans and Egyptians made them incredibly famous. After Ptolemy had collected their writings, he summarized them in this book. Unfortunately, he did so with such brevity that the bulk of the art is missing. It would have been better if he had followed the example of the great Hippocrates. After he had transformed the data into a systematic art, he should also have written a book of individual examples on the model of the epidemics. Point 50. The Roman historians, in other words, seemed to Cardinot to prove that the tradition of Near Eastern astrology had survived as late as the 2nd century AD, and that Ptolemy's achievement lay in his synthesis of data and principles that had previously been scattered. Cardinot did not lack boldness. Because Ptolemy in fact wrote no epidemics, he tried to fill this lacuna by compiling his own horoscope collections, even though the task involved great technical difficulties. Point 51 After Cardinot drew up and interpreted the horoscope of Nero, for example, he saw that he had assumed a wrong birth date. This error, however, did not bother him. He computed the positions of the planets for the correct date and produced a second horoscope, which he not only included in the second edition of his collection, but also interpreted in exactly the same way, and even in the same words. He proudly announced that the second horoscope and the emperor's character resembled one another as precisely as two snowdrops, saying nothing about the first horoscope. Point 52 Even more curious were his dealings with another horoscope, that of Jesus. 
Cardinot found that the details of Jesus's horoscope considered as that of an ideal human being corresponded with startling precision to the requirements laid out by Ptolemy. He went so far as to suggest that this one horoscope could have formed the entire foundation for Ptolemaic astrology on its own and commented on it at great length, shocking many readers. Cardinot's horoscope collections took a digressive and sometimes bizarre form that their austere Hippocratic prototype lacked. But their central inspiration remained clear, he compiled them both to confirm and to exemplify his view that the experiment at 272 of the Caesars Tiberius, Claudius, Nero, Domitian, Hadrian, and Gordian, as well as the things that befell Pisanino in our time, show the truth of the art. 53. Cardinot's admiration for Chaldean and Egyptian court astrologers had limits. He rarely emphasized the age of their observations, and took more interest in the well-documented achievements of the astrologers of Imperial Rome than in the legendary ones of their older predecessors. Gradually he came to see that he could not even reconstruct the doctrines of the last Chaldean astrologers in detail. The humanist Pietro Crinato and others had pointed out that Firmicus Maternus, writing in the 4th century, compiled rich materials on the powers of the degrees of the zodiac, which he described as Egyptian in origin. Daurico used Firmicus to identify Hermes Trismegistus, along with his pupils Pito Ceres, Nesepso, and Esculapius, as early practitioners of astrology. 54 Cardinal, however, remarked disappointedly that Firmicus was a grammarian, not an astrologer. From Firmicus's scattered and unsystematic data, the sources for which he did not cite, Cardinot felt able to draw no firm conclusions. The Greek commentaries on the Tetrabiblos, which Hieronymus Wolf published in 1559, offered little more than a few bibliographical details about Ptolemy's predecessors. 55. In so far as Cardinot insisted on reconstructing ancient astrology from preserved sources, through precise inferences, he resembled some of the astronomers who had attacked similar problems before him. More than one of his Renaissance predecessors had, in fact, devoted some serious attention to the early history of their art, both because they still relied so heavily on ancient data and methods and because they were also well-schooled humanists to whom a historical and philological approach came readily. As early as the mid-15th century, Reggio Montanus produced the first modern, critical interpretation of the basic handbook of ancient astronomy, Ptolemy's Almagest. Here and in other, shorter texts, he devoted some attention to the lost sources Ptolemy drew on, and drew from the sources sober reconstructions of ancient practices and results. Instead of mocking the pitiful instruments the Greeks had used, Regio Montanus offered a detailed reconstruction of the armillary sphere, which Ptolemy used, above all, and Hipparchus before him, to investigate the motions of the stars 56. This instrument, Regio Montanus held, enabled the Greek astronomers and their Islamic successors to found scientific astronomy. The modern astronomer who wished to improve on them must use it as well. Egyptians and Chaldeans played almost no role in Regio Montanus's history of astronomy. Cardinot's work on the astrological tradition had far more in common with Regio Montanus than with Reticus. The decline and fall that Ramus and Reticus sketched out found its complement, or opposite, in Cardinot's sketch of cultural and technical progress. Last stop. Back to Kepler. The period of intellectual transition around 1600 saw many intellectuals show their willingness to work from contradictory premises without feeling para. 273. Lost. Kepler read both Reticus and Cardinot, with care. In his first book, The Mysterium Cosmographicum of 1596, he cited Reticus's attack on Ptolemy. 57 For years to come he would continue, as he did in the Mysterium, to account for Ptolemy's mistakes by historical research and to rebuild astronomy on a new empirical basis, just as Reticus had recommended. Reading Cardinot left a deeper mark on Kepler. True, he believed that Cardinot was not the best in astrology, and explained that the Italian had not practiced his art empirically, in Kepler's sense, in his aphorisms one often sees that he writes them on the basis of one example 58. Still,
Cardinot was the only modern astrologer who really continued to interest Kepler. Throughout his life, Kepler worked on the relationship between the astrological aspects and the musical consonances. He found the inspiration for this, as he said, in Cardinot's commentary on Ptolemy, where Cardinot tried to use the principles of musical harmony to explain the aspects. From De Varietate Kepler learned that Ptolemy had devoted an entire, as yet unpublished book to harmonics. The interest in the music of the spheres that led Kepler to hunt for manuscripts of Ptolemy and prepare a critical edition of the text was thus awakened by Cardano.59 In his own Harmonis Mundi he went so far as to speak of the correspondence of the aspects with musical consonances, as set out by Ptolemy and explicated by Cardano 60. The treatments of the history of astronomy and astrology that Kepler laid out in the preface to his Tabulae Rudolphini and elsewhere gave Ptolemy the starring role and emphasized progress, much as Cardano had long before. Towards the end of Kepler's years in Prague, he encountered serious intellectual and political difficulties. The Emperor Rudolf II and others pressed him to evaluate the current situation of the empire astrologically and to derive practical advice for them from what he observed. Kepler, however, no longer believed that astrology could predict individual fates or events. He cited examples from the history of Roman astrology, hoping to convince his masters that the political influence of astrologers had led to crises and revolutions. Tacitus, for example, had rightly condemned the astrologers as disloyal to those who held power and deceitful to those who sought it. Thrasyllus and other evil counselors had used their prestige as astrologers to exercise an evil influence on more than one emperor. 61 Kepler, in short, followed Cardano in investigating the social and political functions of astrology above all in the context of the Roman Empire just as he had when he treated astrology itself as a relatively modern discipline the development of which could be reconstructed only from late sources and for the historical period. Even for the later Kepler, the opponent of classical astrology, Cardano still provided essential hints and guidance. The divergent genealogies of science that Reticus and Cardano traced were in fact the two complementary strands of a double helix. Each reflected its creator's effort to put ancient science back into its historical context and to trace its development in some detail. Each provoked and stimulated Kepler. 274. And each supplied him with vital materials. When Kepler gave his account of ancient science visual form on the title page of the Rudolphine Tables, it took the form of a splendid round temple of astronomy, designed to indicate how and where the art had developed. 62. Both Reticus and Cardano contributed their modest. Legitimizing a discipline. James Mackenzie's History of Health, 1758. Haiki Michael Lee. Preservation of Health and the Prevention of Disease, is a kind of neutral ground, between the several branches of medicine, and the common sense and daily observation of well-informed men, and of course is open to everyone. 1. From the above words of Sir John Sinclair it becomes clear why the field of hygiene can be considered an interesting topic for medical historians. Hygiene was understood as one of the five principal parts of academic medicine, but at the same time the part of medicine that was most closely associated with the interests of the laity. Prevention was already in the 18th century at the periphery of the physician's professional interests and therefore hygiene was the very field where academic and popular medicine most easily ended in confrontations. Point two. The history of hygiene, or dietetics, three in early modern Europe has hitherto mostly been written of as a part of popular medicine, or the popularization of academic ideas in vernacular medical literature. Point four, almost no attention has been paid to preventive medicine as an academic discipline or to the various writings where the scientific nature of hygiene was compared with other branches of the medical discipline. The popular medical health books and manuals constitute, however, only one part of the medical literature that deals with dietetical problems. If we turn our gaze to academic or learned writings in general, John Sinclair's Code of Health and Longevity is, perhaps, not the most interesting example. In 1758 James Mackenzie, 1680-1761, a Scottish physician, wrote a book called The History of Health and the Art of Preserving It 5. The work consists of three parts, an introduction, 
15 pages, A History of Dietetics entitled The History of Health, 310 pages, and Mackenzie's Own Rules of Health, 140 pages. These three parts together amount to almost 500 pages. As a work, it differs totally from other contemporary histories of medicine such as Daniel Leclerc's Histoire de la Medicine, 1st ed. 1696, English trans in 1699, or John Fryne's History of Physic, 172,526.6. In his introduction Mackenzie sets forth his intentions. First he introduces himself as a writer, he was a retired country physician, who due to his age could no longer pursue the painful practice of a country physician. If Mackenzie could no longer ride long journeys to remove distempers, he could nevertheless try to prevent them by presenting the most effectual rules to preserve. 278. Health. He saw clearly the meaning of history for his pursuit, that I might add a greater weight and authority to these rules, I resolved to trace them from their sources, by giving the history of the whole art of preserving health, from the most remote antiquity down to the present time. 7. It would be a hasty conclusion, however, to treat Mackenzie's book exclusively as an old man's hobby horse. In fact, he had in mind more ambitious plans in trying to defend hygiene as a part of medicine by using history as a means of legit imation. Point eight, he also wanted to stress the measurable nature of medicine in general, and hygiene especially, which was partly due to instruments that had been invented in this field. For Mackenzie, this was a further proof for the scientific status of hygiene. Point nine. In the introductory part of his treatise, Mackenzie criticized the prevailing situation in the field of dietetics, and especially the use of the term non-naturals, which was a central concept in the preventive part of medicine. The very sound of the epithet non-natural, when applied to aliment, air, sleep, etc., so essential to the subsistence of mankind, is extremely shocking. 10. He attributed the term to the peripatetic school and, according to him, non-naturals cannot be understood without commentaries. In the latter part of his book he tried to lay the rules for a new kind of hygiene that would no more exclusively depend on the principles of Galenist humoral pathology, namely on the six non-naturals. Mackenzie's criticism leads us to several questions concerning the status of preventive medicine in early modern Europe. What were these non-naturals? How were they used in the organization of dietetical literature? And above all, why did Mackenzie not approve of using the term? Thus my present study consists of two parts. First I am going to give an overview of the history of preventive medicine, and how it was established in the medical curriculum at the time of the Renaissance. Second I am going to introduce Mackenzie's own ideas and show what he meant by his criticism, and in what way he thought hygiene could be legitimized as a part of medicine in the mid-18th century. Natural, non-natural, and contra-natural. In Western medical tradition the factors influencing health and disease were divided into the natural, the non-natural, and the contra-natural. The division had its origins in ancient medical thinking, but it took shape in medieval commentaries. Point 11 The Latin translation of Johannidius's introduction to Galen, the Isagogy, clearly divided material into residential naturals, residential non-naturals, and res contra naturum. The same idea of non-naturals as well as the term itself are found in the Latin translation of Holly Abbas's royal book, The Liber Pantene. Holly Abbas directly connected the residential non-naturals with the number 6.12. Natural things form the basic constitution of an individual human body. There are seven of these, such as elements, qualities, humors, and spirits. They. 279 provide a basic set of factors that are essential for life, but which also are subject to great variation in order to produce either a healthy or a diseased state of life. The non-naturals, by contrast, are those things which are able to cause variation in the natural constituents and functions. The traditional list of the six non-naturals usually included the ambient air, food and drink, exercise and rest, sleep and waking, evacuation and repletion, and the passions of the soul. 
The non-naturals are also essential aspects of life, but the individual has more or less control over the particular ways in which they are used for example, how much and what kind of food one eats and they can be either helpful, harmful, or indifferent, depending upon how one lives life. If carried beyond a certain point they can have more long-lasting effects in the form of disease. This brings us to the things contrary to nature, which include diseases, their causes, and their symptoms. 13. In early modern commentaries the whole field of medicine was usually divided into five sub-disciplines, anatomy, physiology, semiology, pathology, hygiene, and therapeutics. The five-fold division had its origin in ancient medical literature, but it gained new popularity in the Renaissance when the classical texts became better known. Point 14 The six non-naturals had in fact a double role in this division. They could either be the conceptual disposition of the preventive part of medicine, i.e., hygiene, or they could also belong to the curative part, namely to therapeutics, which was usually further divided into three sections, the use of diet through the right use of the non-naturals, surgery and pharmacy. As to the term non-natural itself, there were usually two different explanations given to it from the Middle Ages on. Either the six non-naturals were considered to be things that were not ordered by nature, like natural things were, but by a human being him or herself, or these factors were considered to be outside the human body and in the sense external to her or him, in contrast to the natural things, which were thought to be internal. Point 15. Preventive Medicine in the Middle Ages in medieval universities the three main medical textbooks utilized were Galen's Tegna Avicenna's Canon and Hippocratic Aphorisms, all of which dealt also with the preventive part of medicine and the six non-naturals. Point 16 In the beginning of the third book of his Tegna Galen discussed the causes of diseases and there he introduces the familiar list of non-naturals, even if he does not mention the term. The third part of the first book of Avicenna's Canon deals with the preservation of health. Moreover, Avicenna speaks about causes instead of things. By calling the non-naturals efficient causes when they harm the body, and necessary causes when they help maintain a person's health, Avicenna gives a good description of the ambivalent nature of the non-naturals. When used in excess, they are causes of sickness, but when used in moderation, they prevent sickness. 280. In medieval commentaries the exact number of the non-naturals was questioned. For example, baths were usually listed, but they appeared under the term exercise and rest or things excreted and retained. At the beginning of the 14th century in his commentary of Galen's Tegna, Torrigiano de Torrigiani asks whether there are more than six non-naturals. He considers whether geographical location, the altitude of the stars, as well as human occupations and customs should not also be included among them, since these conditions unavoidably affect the environment in which the human body flourishes or fails to flourish. Like most of his contemporaries, he concludes, however, by deciding that the traditional six categories in fact provide an adequate scheme of division that should properly be understood to include the additional environmental conditions mentioned above. 17. In the Middle Ages, However, dietetics was not just a part of academic medical literature, but already constituted a central part of popular medical literature as well. Dietetic information is also to be found in the related genres of the concilium, i.e., a physician's report prescribing care and treatment for an individual patient on a specific occasion, and in calendars, i.e., Volkskalender in German, point 18 Regimen Sanitatis Salernitanum, for example, was a health regimen from Salerno's medical school written in verse, which became extremely popular in late Middle Ages and early modern Europe, especially as it contained a commentary which was thought to have been written by Arnaldo de Villanova in the 13th century. In Salerniton regimens all the six non-naturals are mentioned, even if the treatment of food and drink is given a central place. Point 19. Medical Humanism and the Recovery of Ancient Hygienic Literature in the beginning of the 16th century, there arose in Italy a movement that has been labeled as medical humanism. Medical humanists translated ancient medical treatises into Latin from the uncorrupted sources in order to reform medical practices. Point 20 With regard to the preventive part of medicine, 
Thomas Lineker translated Galen's De Sanitate Tuenda in 1517, Erasmus made a new edition of Plutarch's work on the same subject, and Junio Paolo Crasso translated Galen's small treatise called Ad Thrasibulum in 1538. The above two of Galen's works are probably the most significant classical contributions to the genre under investigation here. Perhaps more clearly than any other author before him, Galen defined the nature of dietetics as an autonomous art. In Ad Thrasibulum he distinguishes the special office of the hygienist from that of the gymnast and the physician. Point 21 This was well understood in the 16th century when preventive medicine was considered to be the other major, but hitherto neglected, part of the art of medicine. In this respect, hygiene, or dietetics, can be compared to anatomy, during the century anatomical writers also were eager to emphasize the independent nature of anatomy and make it, instead of natural philosophy, the basis of all medical studies. Point 22. 281. In the 16th century medicine was usually divided into preventive and curative parts. Most writers considered the preventive part to be primary and more valuable than the curative one. Regarding this claim, they sought evidence from ancient sources, and usually found it, too. In Ad Thrasibulum Galen had distinguished four different stages of health, two of which could also be called neutral ones, nutrum. Distinguishing the various types was an important task for the physician, because he had to choose between preventive and curative measures. If the body was diagnosed to be in a healthy or neutral state, he should strengthen the balance of the temperaments, the principal similia similibus. If the patient was thought to be ill, however, the disease ought to be cured by using the opposite effects, the principal contrario contraries. 23. In the first part of the 16th century most authors on preventive medicine just made translations of newly found ancient texts, but in the second half there emerged a new tradition of commentary based on these translations. The ancient interpretations were not taken for granted anymore, but the need for new contributions was also increasingly understood in this field of medicine. As a result, two major commentaries on preventive medicine were written during the latter part of the century. Girolamo Cardano wrote his De Sanitate Tuenda in 1560.24 Cardano's work consists of four books, the first of which is a general introduction to the subject. In this book the six non-naturals are also dealt with. In the second and third books, Cardano deals more profoundly with different foodstuffs and drinks. The last book is dedicated to the themes of old age and longevity, where he tries to identify general symptoms of longevity, which can be considered, for the most part, as true indications of long life, when they occur in the same person. Cardano named three things. Firstly, a long-lived person must descend from a long-lived family, at least by one of the parents. Secondly, he or she must be a cheerful person, and thirdly, she or he ought to be a naturally good and sound sleeper. Fifteen years later another Italian scholar, Giulio Alexandrini, finished his large treatise entitled Salubrium Civ de Sanitate Tuenda, 1575. He divided his work into 33 books which consist of over 600 columns. In Alexandrini's view, the preventive part of the medical art should be considered to be most important, but nonetheless it was the most neglected part of medicine. He touched on all the six non-naturals, but dealt most profoundly with food and drink, as did many other 16th century writers. Some of the non-naturals were also treated in separate studies, such as Girolamo Mercuriali's Artis Gymnasticae, 1559, or Andrea Bacci's work on baths, De Thermis, 1571, point 25. Two 16th century popular writers. Cornero and Elio. In the 15th and especially in the 16th century, medical advice books, most of which were written in the vernacular, grew extremely popular. There were several reasons for this growth. In the Italian city-states there arose a new 282. Civilized group, the bourgeoisie, which was willing to read different kinds of advice books. At the same time, numerous advice books for princes were published and were often called mirrors, such as The Mirror of Health, 
or first NSP gel. 26. The invention of the printing press made this kind of material more available, and some of these health mirrors reached several editions. For example, Thomas Elios' The Castle of Health and Thomas Moulton's The Mirror of Health both reached over 20 editions during the 16th century. 27 The fear of plague was another factor that increased the demand for health manuals. Many citizens were able and also willing to hear or read advice on how to avoid plague, which raged several times in Europe during the 16th century. A Venetian nobleman Luigi Cornaro wrote in the middle of the 16th century a book called Discorsi della Vita Sobria, which became one of the most popular books ever on longevity. 28 In his discourses, Cornaro takes his own life as an example of what a moderate and regulated life can result in. Cornaro's book concentrates on alimentation, but all the other non naturals are also mentioned. Longevity was his primary aim and a regular, moderate diet the means to attain this end. Part of the attraction of the book resulted from the fact that Cornero was claimed to have been almost a hundred years old while writing it. It was, therefore, easy to consider him as an authority on matters dealing with longevity. 29. Cornero's Discorsi della Vita Sobria was, moreover, noted approvingly in the academic world, for example, in Girolamo Cardinos de Sanite Tuenda. His book was also translated into Latin at the beginning of 17th century by Leonard Lessius, a Belgian Jesuit who stressed the religious aspects of temperate life. At the turn of the 18th century, 1714, Bernardino Ramazzini, a professor of medicine at Padua, wrote his own annotations to Cornero's treatise. Thus it can be seen that the barriers between academic and non-academic writings in this field of medicine were not insuperable. This was partly due to the fact that Galenist humoralism and the idea of the six non-naturals was the organizing principle both in the academic and popular medical traditions. 30. In England the most influential of 16th century popular health books was Thomas Elias, CA 1490-1546, The Castle of Health, which first appeared in 1536.31 It was also the first health book written in the English language, except for the translation Regiment Sanitatis Salernitanum, which had appeared eight years earlier. The Castle of Health is divided into four books. The first of these introduces the general principles of Galenist humoral pathology concerning the four humors of the human body and their balance. The second book consists mainly of an introduction to over a hundred different foodstuffs and cooking recipes, and this also contains a short introduction on exercise. The topic of the third book is the recovery of the humoral balance through purgatives and vomiting. It also contains a description of central human passions such as anger, grief, and joy. The fourth book is dedicated to poor digestion and to analyzing the symptoms of different diseases by examining the urine. 283. The whole treatise ends in an introduction on the ideal diet which should be followed, especially during pestilence. Francis Bacon and the Idea of Longevity The theoretical background of the popular medical advice books was the same as that of the academic commentaries, in both the idea of health was based on the theory of the regulation of individual humoral balance through the use of the six non-naturals. In these popular books, however, the emphasis was not on the doctrine of causes of diseases. Instead they concentrated on practical medical advice. The main question was, is it possible to prolong your life, and if the answer is positive, then by what means? 32 Most of the 16th century authors did not see any kind of conflict between the prevention of diseases and the prolongation of life. In this sense, however, Francis Bacon was an interesting exception. In the second chapter of the fourth book of The Advancement of Learning, Bacon mentions the three parts of medicine, the preservation of life, the cure of diseases, and the prolongation of life. He explicitly notes that the last of these ought to be kept separate from the other two. According to Bacon, the last part of medicine, the prolongation of life, is new, deficient, and the most noble of all. Men should rightly observe and distinguish between those things which conduce to a healthy life, and those which conduce to a long life. For there are some things which tend to exhilarate the spirits, 
strengthen the bodily functions, and keep off diseases, which yet shorten the sum of life, and without sickness hasten on the decay of old age. There are others also which are of service to prolong life and retard decay, which yet cannot be used without danger to health, so that they who use them for the prolongation of life should at the same time provide against such inconveniences as may arise from their use. 33. As we saw in the case of Cornero, most of the classical and Renaissance texts on preventive medicine were based on the doctrine of moderation. In Bacon's view, however, things that are so strong that they turn back the course of nature cannot be mixed with common food or compounded with any medicine. Instead, they ought to be used in series, and regularly, and at set times recurring at certain intervals 34. Unfortunately Bacon himself did not give a detailed consideration of the things by which the prolongation of life could be attained, but was content with outlining some general principles. After the Counter-Reformation in the 17th century, popular health books acquired more religious and moral tones, especially in Germany. It was the duty of a human being to remain healthy, not just a personal duty, but also a duty towards the state. 35 on the whole, until the mid-18th century these popular books on health and longevity for laymen fell into two broad categories. To the first of these belongs books on regimen and long life, which 284 were clearly written for the leisured and educated. Such texts were often as much moral treatises as medical ones. Thus books like Cornero's Discorsi or George Cheney's An Essay of Health and Long Life, 1725, were to be read and contemplated. 36 to the second category belongs more pragmatic health manuals, consisting essentially of recipes or lists of medicaments and their application in the home treatment of perceived illness. These books were not so much to be contemplated as to be used in kitchens and sick rooms. 37. Hygiene in the medical curriculum in early modern Europe. It can be said that at least from the mid 17th century, one can trace in European universities the development of a self consciously scientific medicine, represented in the teaching of those faculties that sought to break free of the Aristotelian heritage, to create a rationally founded pathology and therapeutics and to critically re-examine the empirical tradition. There developed in parallel a medical profession that strove to establish clearer boundaries between itself and non-professionals and to base its claim not only on experience but also on the mastery of a scientific medicine not accessible even to educated laymen. 38. As regards the preventive part, in the introductions to the whole discipline of medicine which were written during the 17th and early 18th century such as Hoffman's Fundamenta Medicini, Hermann Conring's Introductio ad Medicinum Artem, and Bauerhaf's Institutions Medici, it is treated more and more briefly. A German physician Gunther Christopher Skelhammer wrote additions to the second edition of Conring's Introductio, 1726, where he tackles the question of whether hygiene or dietetics really is a part of medicine or not. Skelhammer nonetheless gives a positive answer to the question, as he does also in his posthumously published Ars Medendi Universa, Volume 3, 1752, but the importance of this discussion lies in the fact that the question was ever raised. The fiercest attack on the preventive part of medicine, however, had already been published in the previous century. In 1630 Petrus Lorimberg, a physician from Rostock, wrote a book called Porticus Esculapi, which was a general introduction to the field of medicine. In this book Lorenberg severely attacks the idea of prevention and wants to exclude it from the canon of medical studies completely. 39 Lorenberg's extended argumentation is briefly summarized below. His basic idea was that all cases in medicine where perfect health is broken can be described as due to some kind of deficiency. Consequently, all such cases do no longer belong to the preventive, but to the curative part, where the aim of the physician is to restore health in the patient. Point 40 On the other hand, the case of perfect health is a natural state which does not belong to medicine at all. According to Lorenberg, even Celsus had confirmed this in his De Re Medica, where he had stated that a healthy person should not go to see a physician. This was already a common proverb at the time of Lorenberg, and also 285. 
Mackenzie notes it disapprovingly in his book when he deals with the seven rules invented by Friedrich Hoffmann. 41. In the first history of medicine in English, the history of physic, 172,324, by John Freund, dietetics is more or less separated from medicine and connected with other arts such as the art of cooking. Point 42 for Freund, as for many of his contemporaries, anatomy and chemistry were the developing and most important parts of medicine. In academic circles medicine was more and more defined through diseases, T.S. nosology and pathology, and the central question was how to cure some particular disease, not any more how to take care of one's healthy body. This was partly due to the fear that in modern times many new diseases were discovered that were totally unknown in classical times and therefore medicine should concentrate on curing instead of caring. The emphasis on cure can also be noticed in some early 18th century medical dictionaries. In G. Motherby's dictionary, which was later corrected by George Wallace, Ma Thurby defined medicine as the art of preserving present and restoring lost health, more properly the last 43. Thus in a way both the preventive and the curative parts belonged still in medicine, but the latter one was already considered to be far more important. The same observation can be made when looking at the discussion that arose when George Cheney published his An Essay of Health and Long Life in 1724. In the preface of his book entitled An Essay Concerning the Nature of Aliments, 1731, John R. Buthnett described the situation in the following way. This book was received by the public, with the respect that was due to the importance of its contents, it became the subject of conversation, and product even sex in the dietetic philosophy. In some of those symposiac disputations amongst my acquaintance, being appealed to, I happened to affirm that the dietetic part of medicine depended, as much as any of the rest, upon scientific principles. Point 44. As a result of his observations, John R. Buthnett decided to write a book about all the non-naturals where the scientific principles of this part of medicine could be expounded. However, only the books concerning aliment and air ever appeared. When James Mackenzie, therefore, took on the task of writing a complete history of health in the 1750s, the whole subdiscipline of hygiene was increasingly considered to be something of less importance to the progress of medicine, or even something that was wholly outside the realm of scientific medicine. Thus this can clearly be seen as an attempt to answer the claims against hygiene. In short, Mackenzie tried to lay a basis for a new scientific hygiene that could meet these challenges. Legit Imation by the Use of History In the short historical sketch in his introduction, pages 512, Mackenzie expresses a clear notion of progress in medicine. He repeats several times in 2. 286. Or three pages words like improve, progress, and improvement. Mackenzie had, however, a somewhat different idea of progress than other 18th century writers on the history of medicine. Daniel Leclerc had noted in his history of medicine that dietetics is the part of the science where almost no progress had taken place since classical times. Mackenzie did not wholly agree with Leclerc, because he tried to include in medicine the new kind of dietetics that had been developed, at least during the previous hundred years. 45. According to Mackenzie, of the six instruments of health, aliment is the only one of which mention is made before Pythagoras. And it was mere necessity that made human beings invent the first rudiments of the art of preserving health. Adam was obliged to contrive some method of dressing the fruits of the earth, in such a manner as to make them agree better with him, than they had done quite rude and unprepared. 46. Hippocrates, however, was the first author to deal with these six articles necessary of life, but those lay scattered throughout his works. Thus Mackenzie considers himself the first author to have attempted to collect them together and build up a canon for this branch of medicine. In spite of his low estimation of past authors, Mackenzie did not see himself as the first modern author in this field. In his view, the modern foundation of dietetics was laid in the works of Sant'Orio Sant'Orio, 1561-1636, a professor of theoretical medicine at the University of Padua in the early 17th century. 47. What was important in Santorio's work, 
according to Mackenzie, was the fact that he had developed the idea of insensible perspiration through the human skin in his book called Ars de Statica Medicina published first in 1614.48. Mackenzie believed that the ancient writers had made right observations in the field of dietetics but, unfortunately, they relied on a very confused medical theory. Thus Santorio was the person who had confirmed the observations of the ancients, but who had also added many valuable observations of his own. It is true that Hippocrates, Galen, and others among the ancients, by diligently observing the operations of nature, and following her steps, have given us excellent practical rules concerning health, but their knowledge of the animal machine was defective, and their reasoning obscure. The nature and quantity of insensible perspiration, discovered by Sanctorius, opened to physicians a much clearer view into the reasons and grounds of the rules of health established by the ancients than they had before. Point 49. Legit imation by the measurable method. Even more important was the fact that Santorio's method was based on measurement and calculation, and thus was mathematical at least with regard to weighing. Santorio had considered that the amount of insensible perspiration through the skin and lungs could be measured by a scale invented by himself. Over the course of many years he had weighed himself many times a day and as 287. A result of these calculations he had formed some basic principles. Firstly, the perspiratio insensibilis that had been known since Erasistratus but which had been considered imponderable, could be determined by systematic weighing. Secondly, insensible perspiration was greater than all other forms of sensible bodily excretions combined. And finally, that it is not constant but varies considerably as a function of several internal and external factors, such as cold and sleep, which decrease it, and fever, which increases it. The mathematical method was considered one of the basic guarantees of the scientific presentation and status of a discipline during the first half of the 18th century. 50 For example, in the introduction to the English translation of Santorio's De Statica Medicina James Kyle wrote that physical writers of late, have with a great deal of industry and success introduced geometry into their studies, and endeavored to account for all that concerns the animal economy upon mechanical principles 51. Within a few decades, however, the applicability of mathematics to medicine was increasingly brought into question. In 1738 John Burton wrote in his book dealing with the non-naturals. For my part, I can't agree with a very great man, who says, that a thorough knowledge of the mathematics, ought to be made the distinguishing characteristic of a physician from a quack, for the mathematics can give us no more help in the cure of diseases, than they can in explaining the mysteries of revealed religion. Point 52. Neither was Mackenzie very keen on adapting mathematics to the field of medicine, or hygiene especially. Method and rules were keywords for him, too, but he did not believe in the force of mathematical methods in this branch of knowledge. Instead, Santorio's measurable method was a guarantee for Mackenzie that dietetics could be claimed to be scientific in the terms of the 18th century view of science. He placed the work of Santorio even before Harvey's ideas of the circulation of the blood. He admitted that the theory of health was greatly improved by the knowledge of blood circulation, but the practical rules for preserving health, however, underwent few alterations, having been founded in nature and confirmed by the experience of ages long before Harvey's discovery. Point 53 For this reason, Mackenzie criticized Frederick Hoffman and other moderns who address the public with such an air of superiority, as if themselves had invented the rules which they only transcribe 54. Interestingly, for Mackenzie the founding father of modern medicine was not V. E. S. Aleus or Harvey, as most of us would be inclined to think today, but Santorio Santorio. In fact, during the 18th century there did not yet prevail any unanimity about the founders of modern medicine. Only a few decades earlier John Freund in his History of Physic, 172,526, had praised Thomas Lineker as the founder of the Royal College of Physicians and, by implication, as the initiator of modern progressive medicine as well. Point 55. Mackenzie expounded in full his sources. He regretted that he has not found all the texts he had been looking for, even though he had searched the immense. 
288. Libraries of Oxford and written to his friends in London and Holland as well. In this context Mackenzie makes an interesting remark about his relationship to the writers of the other fields of medicine. He states that systematical writers in physic I seldom take notice of, as most of them touch but very slightly on my subject. 56. The gap between hygiene and other parts of medicine seemed to be a reality for Mackenzie. He stated that he wanted to preserve the spirit and sense of past authors rather than give a close translation of their words, and thus tried to reduce different precepts to a proper method. In the end of his introduction, while dealing with his dedication to the Bishop of Worcester, Mackenzie connects the preservation of health with philosophical, namely moral, issues. In his view, this branch of medicine is a philosophical as well as a medical subject. 57. Mackenzie even saw it as a duty to take care of one's own health. He wanted to upgrade the status of dietetics also by referring to its high moral principles, and to the common good which is attainable, if certain rules are followed. Laying out a new basis for hygiene. Mackenzie's Rules of Health In the last part of his History of Health James Mackenzie introduces his own rules of health as the basis of a new dietetics. In his own words he had collected into a narrow compass those general and particular rules which are most conducive to health in the several periods and circumstances of life. 58. These rules of health, however, cannot be understood without some basic facts about the functions of the human body, the animal economy, as it was termed in those days. 59. And here we may, with pleasure, remark a surprising agreement and harmony between the successful practice of the anti-ants, directed only by their assiduous observation of nature, and the mechanical theory of the moderns, founded upon the wonderful structure of our solids, and the perpetual rotation of our fluids, with which the ancients were unacquainted. Anatomy discovers 10,000 beauties in the human fabric, which I have no room to mention here, nor is it possible, in a performance of this kind, to describe the geometrical accuracy with which the author of nature has formed every part of the body to carry on the animal economy, and answer the various purposes of life. All I propose in this place is, by touching upon a few particulars, to give those, who are unacquainted with our profession, a general idea of the structure of their own bodies, from which they will easily apprehend, that intemperance, sloth, and several other vices and errors, have a necessary and mechanical tendency to destroy health. 60. In Mackenzie's view, Hermann Bauerhav was the man who had given the most complete view of the animal economy. His book, however, was written for physicians only, and no man, probably, of any other profession will ever take the pains to understand it perfectly. 61. 289. As regards the rules of health, some of them are general or common to all ages and conditions of men, and some are particular, or adapted to different periods and circumstances of life. Under the general rules are comprehended those which relate to the six instruments of life, as air, aliment, etc. together with some other useful maxims. Under the particular rules are reckoned, first, those which are peculiar to different temperaments, namely, the bilious, sanguine, melancholic and phlegmatic. Secondly, those rules that belong to different periods of life, as infancy, youth, manhood and old age. Thirdly, those that are appropriated to different conditions and circumstances of men, considered as active and indolent, wealthy or indigent, free or servile. 62. The last group of rules mentioned by Mackenzie deals with the social circumstances of his environment. During the previous centuries the dietetical literature was mainly directed to the upper middle class. In the treatises the leisured and unhealthy courtly life is compared with the active and healthy life in the countryside. The life of urban intellectuals, who did not have enough exercise, was often considered dangerous for one's health. 2.63. Also, in his history of health James Mackenzie held the opinion that even poor people have always some leisured hours during the day which may be employed for the purpose of health. He came to the conclusion that the poor, if they are virtuous and cleanly, have great advantages over the rich, with respect to health and long life, 
as the narrowness of their circumstances prompts them to labor and withdraws all temptations to luxury. 64. The quotation well confirms the claim made recently that the equation of health with the poorest sections of society can be interpreted as an implied justification for doing nothing about their condition of life. 65. Mackenzie wanted to replace the six non-naturals with the term six instruments of life 66. According to our writer, the term non-naturals is extremely shocking, even if the six things themselves are necessary to the life of man. Mackenzie thus followed the Galenist distinction of the six non-naturals, even if he condemned the actual phrase, and he even stuck to the temperaments as the four basic human constitutions. Thus Mackenzie was not able to consider the discipline of hygiene in a new light, even if his division between the general and particular rules is reminiscent of the division that later came to be called public and private hygiene. In the ancient world the human constitution had been highly individual and thus the regimens which were to be followed were always written for some particular person, never for a group or a class of people. During the 18th century, however, the idea of common hygienic rules was introduced and it gained acceptance rapidly. 67 The other important change in the late 18th century hygienic literature was the new emphasis put on environment and its impact on the individual. In the Galenist framework an individual could affect his own health by following the regimen, but in the more and more popular. 290. Hippocratic emphasis, the environment increasingly determined human society, manners, and health. 68. The Aftermath of Mackenzie Mackenzie's history of health gained wide popularity after its publication and in two years it went to three editions and was translated into French and German. 69. The book was considered as a general introduction to the history and practice of hygiene which, in spite of the critique mentioned above, was in general still held to be a part of medical studies. However, when the public health movement spread rapidly at the end of the 18th century, Authors like Mackenzie, who in spite of some reformatory ideas, had approved the classical idea of hygiene as a personal program, began to look hopelessly outdated. In any event, Mackenzie's ideas lived an interesting afterlife in John Sinclair's 17541835 book The Code of Health and Longevity. 70 Sir John Sinclair, first president of the Board of Agriculture, was a typical encyclopedist of his time who tried to build up a system he called the Codian system of literature, in which all knowledge was to classified into four departments, comprising agriculture, health, political economy, and religion. After the Code of Health he published a similar Code of Agriculture, 1817, but the other two works were never completed. The Code of Health and Longevity was directly influenced by Mackenzie's book, even to the extent that some considered it to be a plagiary of it. Sinclair's intention was to lay out in similar vein the rules of hygiene, and he also included in his work a list of all dietetical literature published until his own time, amounting to 1,878 items, 71. In the last volume of the Code Sinclair also included some translations of central dietetical texts such as Santorio's book De Statica Medicina, which had been a source of inspiration for Mackenzie, too. However, Sinclair also admired the recent work of Jean Noel Halley, where the idea of public health dominated the field of hygiene, and Halley's article on hygiene was translated in the last volume of Sinclair's Code.72 In spite of these additions, Sinclair's book was already considered to be too old-fashioned to be of any use in contemporary practice. Already by the 1790s modified hygienic humoralism had become outdated, partly because it no longer provided an adequate terminology for the late 18th century physiology of the nervous system and sense impressions. 73 In other words, mechanical explanations had turned to vitalist ones. 74 This does not mean, however, that hygiene as a discipline would have definitively been discarded from scientific medicine. Rather it had once more to be scientifically justified. This was the situation already in the 1820s and 1830s when the professionalization of public hygiene was established. 75. The mantle of Muller and the ghost of Goethe, interactions between the sciences and their histories. Nicholas Jardine. Introduction. 
In much of the recent literature the interactions between the scientific disciplines and their histories are treated as inessential, undesirable, and avoidable. Exceptionally, when data collected long ago are of current relevance, scientists may have to concern themselves with the histories of their disciplines, but otherwise pursuit of the history of the sciences is no part of the practice of the sciences themselves. Likewise, to the extent that historians of the sciences show themselves prejudiced by current scientific beliefs or involved in current scientific debate they depart from properly historical research and writing. Further, it is often implied, such entanglements are unnecessary. Thus the persuasive and polemical uses of history by medics and scientists are treated as merely rhetorical moves, as if it were always open to them to forswear such shabby tactics in favor of wholesomely rational argument and objective presentation of information. One moreover, imposition by historians on past actions and beliefs of presuppositions, concepts, and values derived from present-day science and medicine is castigated as a vice, curable through honest reflection on their prejudices and sympathetic attention to past agents' own categories. Point two. The study which follows does not directly address general philosophical and historiographical issues. Point three, rather it sets out to show by example that these views about the separability of disciplines from their histories are too easy and simplistic, that at least in some fields and in some periods historical work is to be seen not as rhetorical embellishment but as inextricable from the processes of scientific and medical discipline formation, and conversely. That historians' concerns with the nature and goals of medicine and the sciences may be sources of interest and critical power. After some historical stage setting I shall tell how Emile du Bois-Raymond and Rudolf Virchow used history to articulate and promote their own very. I thank Professor Robert Brain, Dr. Sarayata Chatterivian, Dr. Michael Hayner, Dr. Harm Kaminga, Professor Donald Kelly, Dr. Marina Fraskaspata, Professor Pio Ratansi, and Dr. Ulrich Schneider for valuable advice. I owe special debts to Professor David Cahan and Dr. Keith Anderton, who offered constructive comments on a draft of this article and kindly rescued me from some outright errors. 298. Different conceptions of science and medicine, their rival plans for the reform of scientific and medical education, and their sharply contrasting visions of the proper roles of science and medicine in German society. I shall conclude with some reflections on the implications of such interactions between disciplines and their histories for the current historiography of medicine and the sciences. Medicine, Science, and Revolution Let us start the story in Berlin in the revolutionary decade, the decade which ends with the insurrection of March 1848 and the reactionary suppression of the liberal reforms at the end of 1849. For in this period Du Bois-Raymond and Verkov shared certain aspirations. Both were taught by Johannes Müller, professor of anatomy and physiology at the University of Berlin, and in 1843 both received their doctorates for dissertations on physiological topics from Müller acting in his capacity as dean of the medical faculty. Both were members of the Berlin Physicalist Gesellschaft. From Verkov's numerous articles in the radical journal Medicinist Reform it is clear that he endorsed the basic reformist goals of the Gesellschaft. And from Du Bois-Raymond's sentimental correspondence with the radical Edward Hallman, it appears that he too was in sympathy with them. First and foremost amongst these goals was the creation of a new kind of teaching and practice of medicine and the sciences, centered on laboratory research. They envisaged a natural science that would unite theory and practice in a new way, opposed on the one hand to blind empiricism, on the other hand to the vain speculations of nadir philosophy. It was to be a strictly mechanistic science with a mechanistic physiology as its standard bearer thus it was substantially opposed to the vitalistic and teleological physiology of their master Johannes Müller. It was to be a unified science, united under mechanistic principles, and a unifying science, fostering the union of the German lands by breaking down the barriers of superstition. The Physicalist Gesellschaft had more specifically institutional goals as well. Its members wanted participation in the government of the university by all university teachers, including Privatdozenten and extraordinary professors, the highest academic ranks to which most of the still rare breed of natural scientists could aspire. 
these plans were to be crushed by a state-dictated decree of 1849, pronounced by the conservative Muller, reluctantly serving as rector of the university. They wanted a standardization of medical education in which natural scientific, clinical, and German language training would be greatly increased. These plans came to partial fruition in 1861 with the replacement of the Tent Amen Philosophicum by the Tent Amen Physicum. They wanted abolition of the state licensing boards with their power to interfere in all aspects of the lives of physicians in some states, for example, the boards permitted a physician to marry only after his fiancée had been vetted. The abolition of the licensing boards was achieved in 1869. Even at this early stage in their meteoric careers, however, there are apparent. 299. Differences of orientation between the confident, emotionally mature Verkov and the insecure, excitable and opportunistic Du Bois-Raymond. 5. For all his occasional fits of revolutionary enthusiasm and thrills at the sight of Republican troops, Du Bois-Raymond played no active role in revolutionary activities, and stayed at home on the day of the Mart Camp. Point six, his primary commitment was already to the laboratory researches through which he dreamed of achieving scientific fame and a prominent place in Berlin society. Worldly affairs he found a distraction from work he had a particular horror of ending up in medical practice. Point seven, he was and was to remain, a university figure. It was through his electrophysiological researches that he sought international recognition as a leading German man of science. And it was in the often ferocious infighting of the University of Berlin and the Berlin Academy of Sciences that he was to exercise his formidable oratorical talents. Verkov, by contrast, was active on a far wider stage a political radical who fought at the Martkamp barricades, a practicing clinician and surgeon at the Cherite Military Hospital, he was already editing medicinist reform and agitating for the formation of the democratically elected free associations that would govern medical and social practice once the petty tyrannies of state regulation were swept away. Point eight. There is, as far as I know, no evidence that Du Bois-Raymond supported Verkov's more radical proposals and much evidence to suggest his lack of sympathy with them. The new medicine envisaged by Verkov was to be centered on a new pathological physiology and a reformed clinical practice. With the help of statistical methods, it would reveal the laws relating material conditions to society and culture, thus it would provide the foundation for social legislation and for the unification and regeneration of the German Vogue. As one of the slogans of the medical reform movement put it, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing but medicine on a large scale. Nine. Further, Verkov was already speaking out fiercely against interference in medicine by outsiders, we dispute the right of any discipline not itself rooted in the contemplation of diseased life to share in the interpretation of its phenomena 10. By contrast, Du Bois-Raymond, like Hermann Helmholtz and Ernst Bruck, endorsed a reformed mechanistic physiology or organic physics centered on study of the healthy functions of living bodies. Indeed, he already dreamed so his friend Carl Ludwig later testified, of precisely the reform of medicine from without that Verkov feared, of going through the medical crawls, burning and destroying, the fiery sword of physics in his hand 11. In the decades of reaction after 1849, Verkov's and Du Bois-Raymond's positions on academic and medical reform diverged. For the rest of his life Verkov battled tirelessly for the reform of medical practice as part of a sweeping program of reformist social legislation. While banished to Würzburg from 1849 to 1856, then in Berlin as professor of pathology, head of a clinical section at the Cherite, city councillor and leader of the progressive liberals in the Reichstag, at every stage, Verkov agitated with outstanding effect for social reforms of medical education, of clinical practice, of hospital building and 300. Design, of public hygiene, of factory and housing conditions, of prisons, of elementary schools, of social insurance, and so on and on, the list seems endless. 12. After 1849 there is, to my knowledge, no evidence of Du Bois-Raymond's having shown radical sympathies. On the contrary, like many academic liberals of his generation, he committed himself to the Humboldtian ideals of his master, Muller, ideals of Bildung, 
of disinterested research, of detachment of the university from party squabbles and the commercial world of practical interests. 13. He was, indeed, keen to give natural science the credit for the technical advances that had bettered man's estate. But his enthusiasm was increasingly dampened by cultural pessimism. The disease of socialism could, he hoped, be defeated, not so the barbarous Americanization of Germany that was the inevitable result of utilitarian attitudes and the commercial exploitation of technology. 14 Nationalistic, chauvinistic, and ever more deeply involved in academic administration, he consistently pleaded the virtues of an academically free university, promoting a balance of arts and sciences, as a vital organ and servant of the state. 15 In his notorious rect oral address of 1870. Der Deutsche Krieg, he even went so far as to describe the university as the intellectual bodyguard of the House of Hohenzollern, receiving a personal letter of congratulations from Bismarck and, a couple of months later, state funding for the palatial new physiology institute for which he had so long petitioned. Point 16 One of the few contentious public issues on which he did see eye to eye with Verkov was that of the need for a total secularization of the state and society. Indeed, he and Verkov briefly joined forces with Bismarck in the Kulturkampf against the Catholics, a move which Verkov later saw as a miscalculation. What of the crucial field of medical education, 17 This was crucial for Verkov because his whole vision of a future German liberal democratic federation was centered on a reformed medicine. And it was crucial for both of them in their careers because the personal incomes they derived from capitation fees were conditional on recruitment of preclinical medical students as was much of the funding of their research institutes. In this field their divergence was especially sharp. Verkov's primary focus was on clinical reform, in particular on the clinical applications of his new discipline of cellular pathology. 18 With respect to teaching his emphasis was on the need for more and better instruction in the sciences both in the schools and in the preparation for the university tentam and physicum. Verkov opposed moves to make the university doctorate a licensing condition for physicians. And like most others in the medical reform movement he pinned his hopes on the reform of the Realschulen, despairing of the elite gymnasia and opposing their exclusive right to university places. Du Bois Raymond, on the other hand, affirmed the priority of physiology over pathology in medical training, and he ardently promoted the preclinical university doctorate in experimental physiology as a precondition of sound medical practice. 19 Moreover, though initially sympathetic to the cause of the Real Schuller, as rector of the university he eventually had a hand in the defeat of Verkov's movement for their admission to the university's point 20 in medical practice, as in other practical. 301. Realms, Verkov showed a constant respect for tradition, in this case the tradition of clinical tact based on long experience. 21 Here it was not the radical Verkov but the conservative liberal Du Bois Raymond who spoke the language of revolution, publicly denouncing the entire medical profession as obscurantist and bigoted. 22. The Mantle of Muller and the Ghost of Goethe. Du Bois Raymond and Verkov repeatedly voiced their commitment to history, both endorsing the slogan that things can be properly known only by their origins. 23. Both were convinced of the value for students of medicine and the natural sciences of instruction in the history of medicine and the sciences. 24. Both wrote extensively on historical topics, and did so in ways which measured up to the high standards of precise and critical scholarship prevalent in the Berlin of Ranka and Momsen, a personal friend of Du Bois Raymond. And, as we shall see, in the history of medicine and the life sciences their writings proved remarkably influential Du Bois Raymond establishing a framework for the interpretation of the history of physiology that remained unchallenged until very recently, Verkov pioneering a type of social history of medicine that still flourishes. But in their writings about history, as in the history they wrote, they differed very sharply indeed. Du Bois Raymond promoted and wrote what he called inductive history, that is, history of the sciences premised on the thesis that the historical path of the inductive sciences is for the most part almost the same as the path of induction itself. 25. Such a history, intended to inspire the students to independent research, tells how progress has been achieved by the heroes of the empirical sciences through rigorous experimental testing of hypotheses. 
From the Archimedean standpoint of the cosmos revealed by the sciences their history appears as the absolute organ of culture and the only real history of mankind 26. Du Bois Raymond here acknowledges Hegel's philosophy of history as his inspiration, remarking that the crucial difference lies in Hegel's commitment to a priori as opposed to a posteriori knowledge. He contrasts this noble and edifying history of progressive understanding of the cosmos with the feudal and pointless bourgeois history of kings and queens, bloodthirsty generals, plots, and assassinations. 27 World history he divides into epochs which end in revolutions, the latest, and, he strongly implies, the last, being the technical inductive age, the age of the experimental method. Opening with Galileo and Bacon, this age has only recently come to its wonderful but dangerous maturity with the fulfillment in industrial technology of Bacon's prophetic knowledge is power 28. Verkov's historicism is more thoroughgoing, permeating all levels of his discourse. Point 29 In his central research fields his methods are declaredly historical or genetic, tracing the etiologies of diseases and of epidemics, the lineages of cells, the genealogies of races, cultures, and institutions. In his extensive works. 302. On local, popular, and disciplinary history, he is above all at pains to show how culture, including the culture of medicine and the sciences, is determined by material and social conditions. Thus, for example, he explores the relations of feudal society and feudal religious institutions to medieval medical practice, and he relates the formation of modern scientific medicine to the institution of teaching in specialized clinical hospitals in France. 30 In a manner reminiscent of the early Marx he is constantly alert to the ways in which theoretical systems reflect the political regimes under which they arise and whose interests they covertly serve how Stalian vitalism reflected and served absolute monarchy, how his own cellular pathology reflects the harmonious cooperation of members of an ideal liberal democracy. 31. Both in public and in their correspondence from 1864 to 1894, largely of a formal nature arising from their joint involvement in the sponsorship of scientific expeditions by the Humboldt Stiftung, Du Bois Raymond and Verkov maintained cordial relations perhaps surprisingly, given their dissonant views and interests, their competition for students and posts, and their aggressive oratory and polemic in other contexts. 32 From the moment of Verkov's triumphant recall from Würzburg to Berlin in 1856, however, there are copious of coded signs of conflict in their historical speeches and publications. At the end of April 1858 Johannes Muller died. He had students in place in well over half the 30 or so chairs of physiology and anatomy in the German lands. 33 he had been, at least in the academic realm, one of the two or three most powerful German men of science of his time. 34 and for many, right across the political spectrum, he was the living embodiment of the Humboldtian ideals of the Wissenschaftlich Gebildeter and of the disinterested Forscher. His mantle was well worth a fight. In this period memorial addresses provided a conventional forum for such struggles. 35 Du Bois Raymond, Muller's successor in the chair of physiology, got in first with a blockbuster delivered to a crowded session of the Berlin Academy of Sciences. Verkov had his say more briefly before a yet larger audience a few days later in the Alla Magna of the university. Reading the two addresses together is a strange experience. It is hard to believe that Verkov and Du Bois Raymond are talking of the same person. They agree on Muller's good looks, his conservatism, his exemplary disinterestedness, and his standing as a reformer of physiology, but there is little further common ground. Du Bois Raymond's Muller owed his successes to a disposition formed by nature and nurture. Born in Koblenz under the French tyranny over the Rhineland, he was inspired to heroic deeds by the warlike demeanor of the Napoleonic troops. 36 He combined his father's powerful physique and fine looks with his mother's willpower, perseverance, and sense of order. 37 In his early studies, he became sunk in the Tramere of Nader philosophy and was led by Goethe into a false valuation of observation over experiment. 38 During his stay in Berlin in 182,324 he attended Hegel's lectures, but his anatomical studies under Rudolfi rescued his from Nader philosophy. 39 As a professor of physiology and 303. 
Anatomy at Bonn he was led to the verge of mental collapse by his auto-experimental studies of sensation and consciousness. Forty however, following the ministerial call to Rudolfi's chair of anatomy and physiology at Berlin, Muller became less speculative, indeed, his subsequent career was a model of disinterested pursuit of empirical knowledge. Point 41. Verkov's Muller II was formed by blood and soil. But how very differently. Like Cuvier, he was stimulated by the mixture of French and German culture in his education. Point 42 His origins were petty bourgeoisie's father was a Kabul Rand Verkov implies, though he does not actually state it, that it was to this that he owed his practicality and talent for first Chung. It was from his mother that he acquired his imaginative religiosity. Point 43 Far from having corrupted him, Goethe saved him from nature philosophical speculation, providing an example of enthalt samekite, self-possession or moderation, in a frivolous age, inspiring him with a dedication to precise observation. Point 44. In their treatments of Muller's career at Berlin the discrepancies are no less striking. Du Bois-Raymond's Muller belonged to a bygone era, his achievements transcended by the new experimental physiology of his students. Muller's careful observation in comparative anatomy and physiology, his polymathy, and his systematizing powers, made him a supreme completer and synthesizer of the work of other Solaterday von Haller. 45 But because of his commitment to plastic observation rather than theoretical analysis and controlled experiment he made no discoveries of the first magnitude. 46 Du Bois-Raymond characterizes Muller as the Erasmus of the Reformation of Physiology. 47 Not one to hide his light under a bushel. He implies that he himself is the Luther, having in mind Luther's famous, and probably mythical, remark Erasmus laid the egg of the Reformation, but I hatched it. For he insinuates that it is he who has surpassed Muller's achievements by introducing the experimental analytic method into physiology. Muller, he suggests, took on the colors of those he had vanquished, combining in his mature career a metaphysical vitalism, derived from the conquered Nader philosophin, with an observational empiricism at odds with metaphysical speculation. Point 48 he himself, Du Bois-Raymond asserts, played the central role in the refutation of Muller's appeal to vital force. Point 49. For Verkov, in sharp and, in this instance, surely deliberate contrast, it is precisely Muller's exemplary mastery of the true inductive method, that is, of hypothesis controlled by minute observation and a genetic approach based on comparison and cautious analogy, that enabled him in the course of his triumphant tenure at Berlin to unify and reform the entire field of the life sciences. Point 50. In connection with their rival views on the reform of medical education, particular interest attaches to the discrepancy between their accounts of Muller's attitude to vivisection. Verkov himself performed many experiments in which damage was inflicted on live animals and the pathological anatomical effects were posthumously examined, but he showed little concern with the physiological monitoring of vivisect animals. Point 51 he reports with apparent approval. 304. Muller's reluctance to vivisect and his belief that little is to be learned about vital functions from the abnormal responses of tormented animals. 52. Du Bois-Raymond, by contrast, is at pains to rebut the view that Muller undervalued vivisection, portraying him as an active vivisector in his early career and remarking with Bernardi and Gusto that it is a necessary attribute of a physiologist that his hands daily steam with blood. 53. At first sight, this is very odd indeed. For Du Bois-Raymond himself did not think of vivisection per se as an important research tool, though, of course, animals had to be sacrificed to provide the living preparations on which he performed his experiments. Indeed, a letter from Carl Ludwig reveals that he had started to learn vivisectional techniques only a few months previously. What is going on here? Ludwig's letter provides a clue. You feel like passing the time away for a while with vivisection, how happy I would be if I could be of nay use to you in this. Everything I can show you is trivial, absolutely commonplace, but that is why it has to be shown to you, else you would never hit upon it. It is necessary to you because the doctors want to see blood, they have to get used to it in good time if they ever want to be efficient in their profession as destroying angels. So come, 
you must crush Muller and can only do so if you step down a few thousand coils from your high region. I shall be glad to help you in this, you will go back to Berlin completely Deemer least.54. It seems that Du Bois-Raymond had reluctantly acknowledged that his electrophysiological experiments were not enough, that performance of demonstration vivisections was crucial if he was to make his experimental physiology sufficiently attractive to compete for preclinical medical students with Muller's anatomy-based teaching. Only by recruiting and disciplining medics through the initiation rites of vivisection could he hope to achieve his reformist goals. In 1877, at the inauguration of his giant new physiology institute, Du Bois-Raymond was to declare his position more explicitly. Comparing the present state of physiology with that of his youth, he tells how, in the absence of teaching laboratories, those of us who wanted to do physiological research had to vivisect frogs and rabbits in their lodgings. Point 55 Later in the address he embarks on a bombastic defense of vivisection against the hypocritical objections of the fox-hunting British, who want vivisection subjected to restrictive legislation. Point 56 He pleads instead for regulation of vivisection by the conscience of the physiologists themselves, and emphasizes the indispensability of vivisection for experimental physiology. Point 57 Such a vivisection based experimental physiology is, he insists, a better training for medics than pathology, an obvious poke at Verkov's adjacent pathology institute. Point 58 Indeed, he concludes, it is the primary task of the institute to provide such teaching in an experimental physiology able to serve as a torch and a weapon in the questionable twilight of medicine 59. No wonder the squeamish Du Bois-Raymond felt compelled to feign belief in the power of vivisection as a tool of research. 305. Let us return to Goethe. In 1861 Verkov followed up his positive assessment of Goethe's influence on Muller and German physiology with a semi-popular booklet, Goethe als Naturforscher. 60 Here Goethe appears as an ideal of humanity, at once supreme artist, enlightened administrator, and distinguished empirical scientist. He is presented as the co-founder with Caspar Friedrich Wolff of the genetic method, generally acknowledged as the key to the empirical study of living beings. Point 61 tribute is paid to his major discoveries in comparative anatomy, comparative physiology, and optics. Point 62. Two decades later Du Bois-Raymond responded with his vitriolic Goethe und Keen and, delivered before the Berlin Academy of Sciences. It opens engagingly enough, playfully contrasting Professor Heinrich Faust in his Gothic cell with the professionate of the new German universities. Point 63 but the tone rapidly becomes aggressive and contemptuous. Du Bois-Raymond presents Goethe as an amateur, one who entirely lacked the organ for theoretical knowledge, namely quantitative and controlled experimentation. Point 64 he denounces Goethe's purely observational methods as incapable of revealing the mechanical causes of phenomena, as having given a disastrously wrong direction to German science, already led astray by speculative nature philosophy. Point 65 His alleged anatomical discoveries here the reader is referred to Verkov's booklet were largely anticipated by others. Point 66 As for his famous theory of colors, it was the stillborn foolery of an autodidact dilettante. 67 Du Bois-Raymond was by this time widely admired for his theatrical oratory, his prunk Vortrag.68 but on this occasion he went too far, questioning the literary quality of Goethe's Faust. In particular, he claimed that Faust himself at once lover, adventurer, man of action, and seeker after contemplative wisdom lacks psychological truth. 69. In his youth Goethe wavered in his commitment to his poetic vocation, admiring the life of heroic action symbolized by Napoleon and wasting much time in administrative activities in Weimar, and the protean Faust psychological untruth is but a projection of Goethe's confused mental state. Point 70 So too, he implies, are the many other logical inconsistencies and ethical monstrosities that mar the work. Point 71 A Goethe strike ensued in the journals and newspapers as Du Bois-Raymond later reported, the Führer was second only to that occasioned by the address in the presence of the king in which he had compared Darwin's achievement with that of Copernicus. 72. Verkov's motives in his tribute to Goethe are transparent is using Goethe to promote his own ideals of humanity and his own program in medicine and the life sciences. Du Bois-Raymond's long-delayed counter-assessment is harder to explain, 
and the following remarks are conjectural. Others of his writings of the period show that Du Bois Raymond was becoming seriously concerned about what he saw as a widespread and dangerous reversion to the speculative excesses of Nader philosophy. At psychologist and physiologist Gustav Fechner, for example, had strayed from the path of empirical science into the swamps of metaphysics, as had the botanist Karl von Nagili and the 306. Zoologist Ernst Haeckel. 73 and he was involved in a heated confrontation with an internationally renowned, ultra-reactionary and eventually insane, astrophysicist, Carl Friedrich Zollner, who had responded to Du Bois Raymond's Über die Grenzen der Naturerkennens of 1872 by holding him up as an example of the way in which arrogance, materialism and narrow specialization lead men of science into skepticism, agnosticism, and irresponsibility. Point 74 further, Du Bois Raymond and Verkov were by now in head on competition for control of preclinical teaching at the university, and on opposite sides in the long running and bitter public controversy over the admission of Raoul Schuller to the university's. Point 75 Small wonder then that Du Bois Raymond decided to make an example of Goethe, so denouncing him as to implicate all who prostitute ideas through their involvement in worldly affairs and all who betray science by straying from the path of analytical experiment. To this it is tempting to add an explanation more in Du Bois Raymond's own style. Given the evidence from his youthful correspondence of his identification with Goethe and of his daydreaming of heroic deeds, together with his adult tributes to such heroes as Frederick the Great, one may well suspect that Du Bois Raymond is denouncing himself, that in describing Goethe's projection of himself in Faust he describes his own projection onto Goethe, that it is he who yearns to be not just an academic man of science, but also adventurer and lover, that it is his own timid fascination with men of action that he attributes to Goethe, that the psychological untruth he detects in Goethe is his own. Point 76 Perhaps it is this undertone of empathy with his victim that makes the attack so unpleasantly effective. The Entanglement of Medicine in Its Histories The historical writings I have discussed have preserved their reputation right up to the present day as important scholarly contributions to the history of medicine and the sciences. And it is hard to challenge this assessment, given that Du Bois Raymond's interpretation of the rise of experimental physiology in Germany has provided the framework for most subsequent accounts, and that Verkov's position as a pioneer of the social and cultural history of medicine is unquestioned. Yet on my reading, these works are to be read also as moves in a power struggle. Both Du Bois Raymond and Verkov are out to advance their personal positions, taking on the mantle and mystique of Muller by portraying him in their own image. Point 77 Both use their selectively interpreted Muller to legitimate their own programs for reform of medicine and the sciences, and Verkov does the same with Goethe and each wields history as a weapon against the type of medicine and science espoused by the other Du Bois Raymond associating Goethe and hence, by implication, Verkov and his program with the speculative excesses of Nader philosophy, Verkov finding in Muller one who had doubts about an analytical, vivisection-based physiology of the type so ardently promoted by Du Bois Raymond. 307. Du Bois Raymond's attack on Goethe can, I think, be read as a defense of a fully articulated position against established disciplinary rivals, not so the memorial addresses for Muller and Verkov's tribute to Goethe. They appear so only if one reads them with hindsight, attributing to Verkov and Du Bois Raymond in the 1850s and 1860s the research programs and ideologies set out in their publications and embodied in the institutions they controlled in the 1870s and 1880s. Set in their proper periods these writings appear rather as stories in the stipulative mode, to borrow Rachel Lawton's apt phrase, histories in whose very writing new methods and disciplinary agendas are articulated. 78 Thus, the section of Du Bois Raymond's memorial address in which he criticizes Muller's methodology contains an account of the proper methods of physiology that is more general than anything in his earlier writings. Point 79 And in Verkov's tribute to Goethe's holistic and poetic vision of nature, we find some of the earliest indications of the vitalist holism that dominated the researches of his later years, but was substantially at odds with the mechanism and materialism of his pre revolutionary propaganda. Moreover, for all their differences about the nature of reform in physiology and medicine, 
these works took a common stand in presenting the reform of physiology as a fait accompli even though their revolutionary programs were far from securely established even within the confines of the University of Berlin. In this conflict Du Bois-Raymond's plan for the reform of medicine was, on balance, a winner. At the hands of his students the experimental physiology of his institute, preserving substantial aspects of his program, remained powerful in these fields far into the present century, whereas Verkov's far fewer students were dispersed, his institute moving away from his cellular pathological program even within his lifetime. eighty, However, Du Bois-Raymond's victory was incomplete. It was not his biophysical program in physiology, but chemical physiology and its successor, biochemistry, that were eventually to dominate academic physiology and medicine. 81 And though defeated in Berlin, substantial parts of Verkov's morphological genetic program and quest for a pathology-centered social medicine were long preserved in Germany in the fields of social hygiene and public health. 82 At the ideological level Du Bois-Raymond's victory seems more clear-cut. For the general image of physiology and medicine that he conveyed in his historical writings lives on in the self-images of physiology and medicine at image of a laboratory-based, objective, experimental physiology that has transformed medicine through its discoveries, the complementary image of a medicine that has become scientific and achieved unprecedented progress through its alliance with laboratory physiology. The vision that Verkov projected in his extensive medical historical writings, that of a social and political medicine centered on a general pathology and creating a new society and culture, has vanished almost without trace. Even at the ideological level, however, Du Bois-Raymond's victory was less than total. Despite the laboratory revolution in medical education and practice. 308. At the end of the 19th century, substantial minorities of medics have continued to protest at the resultant scientism that devalues clinical tact, experience, and humanity. 83 And though few would now endorse Verkawian visions of a general cultural pathology and social medicine, there remain many who insist that it is only in the context of comprehensive social, educational, and political reform that the goals of medicine can be realized. The angry recent debates between those who blame the rising incidence of tuberculosis in Britain on social deprivation and those who blame it on mismanagement and professional incompetence in the health services shows the persistence of the contrast between official scientific and unofficial Verkawian perspectives. Explanation of the fates of Du Bois-Raymond's and Verkov's medical reform programs would be a massive undertaking, far beyond the modest scope of this article. I do, however, venture the suggestion that, at least in the local context of the University of Berlin, Du Bois-Raymond's disciplinary victory owed much to his oratorical performance, of which his historical addresses form a substantial part. 84 One may well suspect that after the foundation of the Prussian Reich, Du Bois-Raymond's Bismarckian bombastics were more in tune with the public mood than Verkov's parades of a reasonable, if sometimes quietly malicious, humanity. 85 Certainly they were more in line with the mood at the University of Berlin after 1870 to see this. One has only to contrast the cautious, humane, and rational public pronouncements of von Ranke and Mommsen with the fiery chauvinism of their successors, the liberal nationalist historians, von Sibyl and Treitsch. 86. In the fields of physiology and medicine Du Bois-Raymond was, if not an outright victor, at least winner on points. What of the domain of historiography? If one looks just at the standard recent histories of physiology one may indeed conclude that Du Bois-Raymond won hands down. For they endorse his historiography at several levels. His memorial address is regularly mined for information about Muller, and the scientific achievements attributed to Muller are by and large those that Du Bois-Raymond attributed to him. 87 Though recently challenged on certain points, it is Du Bois-Raymond's general picture of the 19th century history of German physiology that has prevailed, a picture in which the speculative excesses of Romantic Nader philosophy were swept away by a new laboratory-oriented analytical and mechanistic. Physiology at the hands of Du Bois-Raymond, Helmholtz, Bruck, Ludwig, and the schools of experimental physiology that they founded, 
a picture in which experimental physiology brought medicine into the fold of the sciences. 88 And at the most general level we find that for much of the present century the historiography of the sciences has been dominated by positivistic narratives of the kind promoted by Du Bois Raymond, stories of triumphant scientific progress mediated by the experimental method. When we turn to medical historiography, however, a rather different picture emerges. Let us consider the historiography of medicine at its major in situ. 309. Chanel cites from the 1930s to the 1950s, the heyday of positivistic historiography of the sciences. 89 first at the Leipzig Institute, then as emigres at the Johns Hopkins Institute, Henry Sigerist and his associates, Walter Pagel, Erwin Ackerknecht, and Oswe Temkin, promoted a historiography far removed from Du Bois Raymond's, a Verkawian historiography which attempted to integrate the history of medicine into social and cultural history, to present each age and culture in its own terms avoiding judgment of past ideas and practices by the standards of present medicine and science. The clash between the positivistic historiography of the sciences and the socio-cultural historiography of medicine of Sigerist's school is dramatically displayed in a sharp exchange between Sigerist and George Sarton, a key figure in the formation of history of science as an academic discipline in America. 90. Sarton opened hostilities in his journal Isis with an editorial aggressively entitled The History of Science vs. The History of Medicine. He started with a lukewarm welcome to the Johns Hopkins Institute and its newly appointed director, Henry Sigerist. 91 He moved on to contrast the popular, but richly funded history of medicine with the poorly endowed history of science. The history of medicine, while bound to mention the scientific discoveries that have so benefited medicine, can deal with them only in a very superficial way. 92. The history of science, however, can do full justice to them. Indeed, Sartan declares, echoing Du Bois Raymond's grandiloquent claims. The history of science should form the core of every history of humanity because the elements which it describes and discusses are the ones which reveal most clearly the rational, progressive, and cumulative tendencies and explain in the best manner the function and purpose of man in the scheme of things. 93. Sigerist responded at once with an editorial in the bulletin of his institute conciliatorily entitled The History of Science and the History of Medicine. There he resisted Sartan's claim that history of science should form the core of medical history. Science is one aspect of medicine and there are a great many other aspects the history of which has to be investigated. The history of medicine in a very large sense is the history of the relation between physician and patient, between the medical profession in the largest sense of the word, including administrators, public health officers, scientists, nurses, priests, quacks, etc., and society. We therefore have to study the position of physician and patient in a given society, their attitude towards the human body, the valuation of health and disease at a given time. 94. He went on to deflate Sartan's grander vision of a history of science at the heart of the history of humankind. History of science, he declared, is just one component of a history of civilization whose study requires the cooperation of a host of historical disciplines centered not on history of science but on political, social, and economic history. 95. 310. Triumphalist and positivistic historiography of the type promoted by Du Bois Raymond and embraced by Sartan and his associates came to dominate the history of science in the phase of its post World War II establishment in university curricula. 96 By contrast, in the history of medicine, though this kind of historiography became common enough, it existed alongside flourishing schools of social and cultural history of medicine. 97 How are we to account for the diversity and richness of 20th century historiography of medicine in comparison with 20th century historiography of the sciences? Part of the answer is straightforward. History of medicine became fully institutionalized within the French and the German medical faculties in the course of the 19th century. 98 The reasons for this early embodiment of history of medicine in medical institutions are complex. Doubtless it is attributable in part to the widespread view that the study of history complemented the study of the classical languages in the moral and humane education of physicians. 
more specifically it may be related to the fact that many fields of medicine, most notably those such as epidemiology involving study of past case histories and their provenances, were perceived as intrinsically historical. Point 99 and, at least in the German lands, this was aided and abetted by the massive impact of Romantic Nader philosophy on medical teaching, for it was a central tenet of Nader philosophy that the history of medicine and the sciences is integral to medicine and the sciences themselves, because it reveals the primordial ideas of antiquity from which they have developed. Point 100 By contrast, as we may gather from Sartan's complaints, even in the 1930s the academic institutionalization of the history of science as an ancillary of the sciences had barely begun. Thus the history of medicine was established as a discipline allied both to medicine and to other branches of history well before the great divide between arts and sciences of the latter decades of the 19th century, whereas the history of science was established in virtual isolation from other branches of history long after the divide.101. But this cannot be the whole story. For the history of historiography shows many instances of rapid shift in style and fashion. Given the evident links between the histories of science and medicine, how are we to explain the resistance of the history of medicine to conquest by positivistic historiography, and how are we to account for the long neglect, from the 1930s to the 1960s, by historians of science of the issues in social and cultural history explored by medical historians? It is fashionable to assume that it is precisely through separation from the presuppositions and values of our science and medicine that the histories of those disciplines can achieve historiographical maturity and sophistication. At the same time, few would deny that current history of medicine is indebted for much of its richness and diversity to the medical historians of the Leipzig School. It comes, therefore, as something of a shock to learn that the leading figures of the Leipzig School, Walter Pagel, Erwin Ackerknecht, and Henry Sigerist, were deeply involved in medical politics and explicitly presented the history of medicine as an instrument of medical education and reform. 102. 311. The issue of morally and politically engaged versus disinterested historiography has itself a long history. Consider, for example, the famous attack of Johann Gustav Droysen on Leopold von Ranke and his school. 103 here, as in the slightly later confrontation between Du Bois-Raymond and Verkov, the fundamental issue was that of Humboldtian academic detachment from worldly affairs versus reformist engagement. The radical liberal Droysen's target was the conservative von Ranke's program for a scientific historiography. Ranke's critical method can yield only a eunuch-like objectivity, Droysen insisted, a heartless and pointless accumulation of facts. 104 True history, Droysen maintained, is an instrument of moral education and reform. Moreover, to the extent that objectivity is attainable in history, it is to be reached not through the impossible attempt to write without a standpoint but through a critical awareness of one's standpoint and moral aims. 105. Droysen's paradoxical thesis that historical objectivity, insofar as it is attainable, is to be reached through the right kind of partisanship had theological and teleological underpinnings that few would now accept. 106 This is not the occasion for a secular defense of Droysen's thesis. Instead, I merely declare my belief that we should side with Droysen, if not with respect to all branches of history at least with respect to the history of medicine and the sciences. The historiographical poverty of much 20th century history of science has resulted from a false objectivity, from a disengagement that disguises an uncritical complicity in the positivistic and triumphalist ideologies of science. Conversely, the historiographic richness and diversity of the history of medicine have, I suggest, been products not of distance from medicine, but of critical involvement in the problems and politics of medical education, practice, and reform. Gender in Early Modern Science Londa Scavenger Men have not only excluded the women from partaking of the sciences and employed by long prescription, but also pretend that this exclusion is founded in their natural inability. There is, however, nothing more chimerical. By a lady, 1763 in 1667 Margaret Cavendish made her famous visit to the Royal Society of London, England's primer institution for the new experimental science. 
Robert Boyle prepared his experiments of weighing of air in an exhausted receiver, and dissolving of flesh with a certain liquor and other entertainments fit for a lady of Cavendish's stature. The Duchess, accompanied by her ladies, was much impressed by the demonstrations and left, according to one observer, full of admiration. 1. Undoubtedly Cavendish's curiosity was not satisfied by this fleeting encounter with the Royal Society's men of science, the meeting was painfully formal. Nor did this short visit make up for a lifetime of intellectual isolation. Cavendish was never admitted to the Royal Society, though she was well qualified for that position, men above the rank of Baron could become members without scientific qualifications. From its founding in 1660 until 1945, the only permanent female member of the Royal Society was the female skeleton in the Society's anatomical collection. Point two. Excluded from the public life of the mind, the Duchess of Newcastle tried to make contact with the learned world through her books. In addition to her numerous poems and plays, she wrote eight books touching on natural philosophy, where she ruthlessly critiqued both the rationalists and the experimentalists. She sent each of her beautifully published volumes to Oxford and to Cambridge, where her husband and two brothers had been educated, and a complete set of her philosophical works to Christian Huygens at the University of Leiden. Point three, her boldness was sharply reprimanded by Joseph Glanville, one of the leading figures in the Royal Society. In explicit reference to her work, Glanville warned that he is a bold man, who dares to attack the physics of Aristotle himself, or of Democritus, or Descartes, or Mr. Hobbes. Apart from this attack, however, her work suffered that worst censure of all neglect. Cavendish was not alone in this regard. Historical memory is highly selective, books that are ignored are lost, their message forgotten. Despite their efforts, women of the 17th and 18th centuries remained excluded from universities and scientific societies. Even the memories of those struggles were eventually also lost, as the words of those who opposed orthodox views of 320. Women's nature were seldom preserved in libraries or taught in university lectures. In the preface to his daughter's 1742 defense of women's right to higher education, the German medical doctor Christian Leperin noted that the renowned Dutch scholar, Anna van Sherman, had published a book on the education of women in the previous century, but that despite all my efforts, it was not to be had. For with Sherman's work misplaced by tradition, Dorothea Erksleben Leperin's daughter never had the opportunity to sharpen her young mind on Sherman's mature thought. Erksleben could not have known that the same fate would befall her own work. Her countrywoman Amalia Holst some fifty years later noted that Erksleben's inquiry into the causes preventing the female sex from studying was no longer available. Holst could not procure a copy, nor could Dorothea Erksleben steps on a professor. Point five feminists such as Theodore von Hippel and Mary Wollstonecraft, known in their day for having contributed to vital social questions, also fell victim to neglect. In 1806, L. W. Y. Sanborn lamented that Hippel's book of only a decade before was nearly forgotten, and Wollstonecraft's almost completely ignored six. It is significant in this context that Anton Amo, the first African to receive a degree from a European university, Wittenberg, 1734, suffered the same fate. His dissertation, De Jure Mororum in Europa, on the rights of Africans in Europe, one of his earliest works, has been lost, while his writings on traditional philosophical questions the art of philosophizing and the mind-slash-body distinction, for example have been preserved in university libraries and archives. Point seven. Knowledge is indeed, as Donald Kelly writes in this volume, acquired, communicated, recalled, criticized, transformed by human effort in the course of time. Eight. Gender is a crucial dimension in this process. As revealed in Margaret Cavendish's experience, modern knowledge was shaped by a series of exclusions, all but a few exceptional women were excluded from European universities for over 700 years, from their inception in the 12th century until the late 19th century, women were not admitted to scientific societies, nor were they regular members of the invisible college that fostered informal intellectual exchange across Western Europe. 
Modern knowledge has also been shaped by apologia reasonings on the supposed causes of these exclusions. Cavendish, in her 1662 female orations, provides her own interrogation of women's marginal position in science, is it nature, something in the physical, psychological, and intellectual nature of women that prohibits them from producing great science? Or is it nurture, their exclusion from institutions of learning? Are women less noble culturally and intellectual life than men, or are feminine quality as he mentioned grace and beauty more noble and worthy of praise? Cavendish left her queries unresolved, assuming the posture of the men at the Royal Society who professed not to meddle in politics or religion. Cavendish remarked that she spoke freely in these orations pro and con but did not take sides. Point nine more important than the consequences for women and other intellectually disenfranchised persons, however, are the consequences for human knowledge more generally. The contours of modern knowledge eth questions it asks, the methods it employs, its disciplinary demarcations. 321. Have been shaped by the systematic exclusions of women and their concern. When Immanuel Kant enthroned pure reason, he dethroned women and something historically disparaged in Western intellectual life as the feminine. The exclusion of women from modern science. The scientific revolution in early modern Europe marks a pivotal juncture for studying the problems women have faced in the natural sciences. The scientific revolution shook the foundations of science, Copernicus challenged the notion of a geocentric universe and suggested instead that the Earth revolves around the Sun, Galileo and Newton revised our notions of the basic laws of matter and motion, in most general terms, Aristotelian science was exploded. This was a time when the conceptual base of science was being refashioned, new institutions were being founded, and the question of participation was much discussed. Historians, treating this profound and far-reaching revolution, tend to scrutinize developments internal to the scientific community, new institutions, new methods, new foundations, and conceptions of nature, external to it, struggles with church and state, spurs from technology and warfare, and intrinsic to it, cultural impulses pervading and formed by science. Seldom, however, do they bring another fundamental transformation in this period the formal exclusion of women from science to bear on the structuring of the sciences. 10. In the reconfiguration of intellectual culture associated with the rise of modern Western science, women and, also a set of values, qualities, and characteristics subsumed under the term femininity were banished from science. In defining why women could not do science, Science theorists were not defining women so much as what was to be considered unscientific in the West. This was not the first time science had been set in a dualistic relationship with its perceived other. During the 17th and 18th centuries scientists had made efforts to distinguish their enterprise from religion, politics, poetic expression, and so forth. In each case, particular limits were set to scientific knowledge by defining science as epistemologically distinct from its supposed opposite. Women as representatives of femininity became repositories for all that was not scientific, in a scientific age women were to be religious, in a secular age they were to be the keepers of morals, in a contractual society they were to provide the bonds of love. At the same time, Western-style middle-class femininity was conceived as a necessary ballast to Western-style middle-class masculinity, according to the theory of sexual complementarity, each gender, though incomplete in itself, joined to the other to make a perfect whole. As it emerged in the 18th century, the exclusion of women from science was made to seem natural and just, a cultural development that fair-minded people could embrace. Four key elements coalesced to render invisible the injustices of exclusion. The culture of science, stretched across these girders, continues today to hold women at a distance. A first factor was the new authority invested in nature and its laws. The 322. Enlightenment posed a challenge to existing orthodoxies of inequality with its rally cry, all men often interpreted to include women are by nature equal. Philosophs and politicians, attempting to build a just society, sought to ground the laws of men in what they considered a higher authoritative laws of nature. Natural law, 
as distinct from positive law of nations, was held to be immutable, given either by God or inherent in the material universe. 11. This first factor is closely allied to a second, the growing authority of science as a privileged source of knowledge about nature. As claims to equality increasingly came to be considered matters not of ethics but of science, natural philosophers came to mediate between the laws of nature and of legislatures. In order for persisting social inequalities to be justified within this framework, scientific evidence would have to show that human nature is not uniform, but differs along the lines of ethnicity, race, and sex. The Marquis de Condorcet wrote in reference to the equality of women, if women are to be excluded from the polis, one must demonstrate a natural difference between men and women in order to legitimate that exclusion. Point 12 This mindset made it seem reasonable for Auguste Comte to claim in his epic 1830s Cours de Philosophie positive that the sound philosophy of biology could offer a resolution to the much acclaimed equality of the sexes. Point 13 Comte believed that one could expect the gradual liberation of subordinated men because there is no organic difference between the dominant and the dominated but he expected the subordination of women to continue forever because it rests directly on a natural inferiority 14. A third factor buttressing the exclusion of women from science was the revolution in scientific views of sexual difference. Point 15 The revolution in sexual science grounded gender, both the social relations between the sexes and ideological renderings of those relations, unredeemably in biology, understood at the time as ahistorical and immutable. For many, physical differences underlay and determined intellectual and moral differences observed in men and women's character and daily lives. Jean-Jacques Rousseau typically asserted that differences in minds and morals were connected to sex, though he admitted not by relations which we are in a position to perceive. Rousseau opened his chapter in Emile, entitled Sophie, or the Woman, perhaps the single most influential piece written about women in the 18th century, with a discussion of comparative anatomy. Point 16 Many agreed that nature herself has drawn the boundary very exactly and correctly between feminine and masculine pursuits. 17. The revolution in sexual science was marked by a methodological rupture in explanations of sexual difference, though the view of woman as a lesser being remained remarkably constant. Point 18 In Aristotelian and Galenic science, divergent sexual temperaments had been seen as driven by cosmic principles reduplicating the macro COSM within the microcosm of the individual body. Breaking with these traditions, anatomists and physiologists of the 18th century deployed empirical methods to weigh and measure sexual difference. The first representations of the female skeleton in Western anatomy epitomizes this scientific search for sexual difference. Point 19 Although drawn from nature with painstaking exactitude, great debate erupted over the distinctive features. 323. Of the female skeleton. Political circumstances drew immediate attention to depictions of the skull as a measure of intelligence and the pelvis as a measure of womanliness. In her influential drawing of a female skeleton, the French anatomist Marie Thyrou d'Arconville, one of the few women to practice the art, portrayed the female skull as absolutely and proportionally smaller than the male, she also drew attention to the pelvis remarkable, in her view, for its breadth and width. In contrast to Thyra D. Arconville, the German anatomist Samuel Thomas von Soemmering portrayed the skull of the female, correctly, as larger in proportion to the body than that of the male. Soemmering drew the ribs smaller in proportion to the hips, but not remarkably so. As one of Soemmering's students pointed out, the width of women's hips should not be overemphasized, they only appear larger than men's because their upper bodies are narrower, which by comparison makes the hips seem to protrude on both sides. Despite, or perhaps because of, its exaggerations, the Thyro D. Arconville skeleton became the favored drawing. So Emmering's skeleton, by contrast, was attacked for its inaccuracies. In subsequent years, when anatomists had to concede the truth of So Emmering's depiction of the female skull as larger than the male skull in proportion to the rest of the body, they did not conclude that women's large skulls were loaded with heavy and high-powered brains. Rather than a mark of intelligence, women's large skulls signaled their incomplete growth. Anatomists in the 19th century used this as evidence that physiologically women resembled children and primitives more than they did European men. 
In 1829, Edinburgh physician John Barclay, using Thyro D. Arkenville's plates, presented a skeleton family in order to shoe, as he said, that many of those characteristics described as peculiar to the female, are more obviously discernible in the fetal skeleton. 20 The seemingly irrevocably sexed body became the epistemic foundation for prescriptive claims about social divisions of labor, power, and privilege. Point 21. A fourth factor sealing this self reinforcing system excluding women from science was the belief that science is value and gender neutral or impartial, unpartiesk, as so Emmering called it. Since the Enlightenment, science has stirred hearts and minds with its promise of a neutral and privileged viewpoint, above and beyond the rough and tumble of political life. 22 So Emmering's self proclaimed neutrality was premised on the absence of dissenting points of view. Those who might have criticized new scientific views were barred from the outset, and the findings of science, crafted largely in their absence, were used to justify their continued exclusion. Value neutral science arose alongside sexual science, both were integral parts of the revolution that brought modern science to life in the West. Yet, inequalities in power made true impartiality impossible in several important ways. First, science cannot be considered value neutral while certain groups are systematically excluded from its institutions. Second, asymmetries in social power lend authority to the voice of science. In the modern intellectual world, disinterest carries with it the premium of objectivity, those, by contrast, without that cloak speak with a lesser voice. Third, science cannot be considered. 324. Neutral so long as systematic exclusions from its enterprise generate systematic neglect, or marginalization, of certain subject matters and problematics. It is instructive in this context to look at the place of the woman question in the work of Immanuel Kant. Though often overlooked by experts in Kantian philosophy, he did in fact have quite a lot to say about women. Kant is now well known for his infamous remarks that creative work in the sciences lies beyond the natural capabilities of woman. He associated woman's beautiful understanding not with science, but with feeling, her philosophy is not to reason, but to sense. 23 Of greater significance perhaps, Kant's discussions of women are relegated to his pre-critical work and anthropological writings, where he mentions lady or woman, Frau and Simmer, Wave, and so forth, more than 300 times. These words appear only five times in all of his critical philosophy. Point 24. Kant's uncritical views on women cannot be excused on the grounds that he was unfamiliar with these issues, he wrote from the 1760s through the 1790s at the peak of Enlightenment debates about women. Theodore von Hippel, a well-known figure in Kant's Königsberg, published his lengthy on improving the status of women in 1792, six years before Kant published his Anthropology. Kant expressed his annoyance with Hippel for having published some of his ideas before he himself got them into print, 25 Hippel took exception to Kant's proclamation that women who wished to engage in science should have a beard 26. Others joined the criticism of Kant's views. L. W. Y. Senborn in 1806 pointed out that the German philosopher's views on women contradicted the axioms of his own system. 27 An anonymous Henriette described Kant's words as unjust, man, she wrote, is made for woman as much as woman is made for man, both are equally human. 28 Amalia Holst provided a possible explanation for Kant's unkindness to women, he simply did not have a wife. 29 the four elements highlighted above are the authority given to nature and to science as the knower of nature, the grounding of gender in biology, and the belief that science is value-neutral participated in the making and remaking of scientific culture throughout the 18th century. It underwrote the fall of the traditionally feminine image of science which Immanuel Kant banished, mourning like Hecuba, from critical philosophy. It fueled battles over scholarly style that banished all feminine quality as metaphysics, poetry, and rhetoric ornament from science 30. It fostered the systematic neglect, or marginalization, of certain subject matters and problematics. We are aware what these inequalities have meant for women, more importantly, these same inequalities held profound consequences for the style and substance of science. Gendered Knowledge 
gender was to become one potent principle organizing 18th century revolutions in views of nature, a matter of consequence in an age that looked to. 325. Nature as the guiding light for social reform. Let me sketch two concrete examples of how gender molded the results of science. The first is the gendering of Linnean botanical taxonomy. As extraordinary as it seems today, it was not until the late 17th century that European naturalists began recognizing that plants reproduce sexually. 31 The ancient Greeks, it is true, had some knowledge of sexual distinctions in plants, Theophrastus knew the age-old practice of fertilizing date palms by bringing male flowers to the female tree, Pliny tells us that peasants' agricultural practices recognized sexual distinctions in trees such as the pistachio.32 plant sexuality, however, was not a major focus of interest in the ancient world. In this era and throughout the medieval period, plant classification generally emphasized the usefulness of plants to human beings as foods and medicines.33. Plant sexuality exploded onto the scene in the 17th and 18th centuries for a variety of reasons including the general interest in sexual differentiation among humans. When sexuality in plants was recognized, everyone wanted to claim the honor for having discovered it. In France, Sebastian Valiant and Claude Joseph Geoffroy tussled over priority, in England, Robert Thornton complained that the honor was always given to the French, though properly it belonged to the English. Carl Linnaeus, always keen to reap his due reward for scientific innovation, not, in fact, the first to describe sexual reproduction in plants, claimed that it would be difficult and of no utility to decide who first discovered the sexes of plants.34. Even in this era, interest in assigning sex to plants ran ahead of any real understanding of fertilization, or the coitus of vegetables, as it was sometimes called.35 botanists distinguished certain parts of plants as male and female, Claude Geoffroy reported, without knowing well the reason 36. The English naturalist, Nehemiah Grew, the first to identify the stamen as the male part in flowers, developed his notion of plant sexuality by analogy to animal sexuality. In his 1682 Anatomy of Plants, Grew reported that the attire, his term for the stamen, resembles a small penis, the various coverings upon it appear to be so many little testicles, and the globulates, or pollen, act as the vegetable sperm. As soon as the plant penis is erected, Gru continues, it falls down upon the seed case or womb, and so touches it with a prolific virtue 37. By the early part of the 18th century, the analogy between animal and plant sexuality was fully developed. Linnaeus, in his Prelidia Sponsaliorum Plantarum, related the terms of comparison, in the male, the filaments of the stamens are the vast deferens, the anthers are the testes, the pollen that falls from them is the seminal fluid, in the female, the stigma is the vulva, the style becomes the vagina, the tube running the length of the pistil is the fallopian tube, the pericarp is the impregnated ovary, and the seeds are the eggs.38 Julian Offre de la Metrie along with other naturalists even claimed that the honey reservoir found in the nectary is equivalent to mother's milk in humans.39. Sexual differential, built on the imperfect analogy between plant and animal life, led to the privileging of certain sexual types over others. Most flowers. 326 are hermaphroditic with both male and female organs in the same individual. As one 18th century botanist put it, there are two sexes, male and female, but three kinds of flowers, males, females, and hermaphrodites or, as they were sometimes called, androgynes. While most 18th century botanists enthusiastically embraced sexual dimorphism, conceiving of plants as hermaphroditic ran into resistance. William Smelly, chief compiler of the first edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, 1771, and an zealous antisexualist, rejected the whole notion of sexuality in plants as the offspring of prurient imaginations, and strenuously disapproved of the use of the term hermaphrodite, noting when using the word that he merely spoke the language of the system. Smelly denounced Linnaeus for taking his analogy far beyond all decent limits, 
claiming that Linnaeus's metaphors were so indelicate as to exceed the those of the most obscene romance writer Forty. The ardent sexing of plants coincided with what is commonly celebrated as the rise of modern botanical taxonomy. In the 16th and 17th centuries plant materials from the voyages of discovery and newly established colonies flooded Europe, increasing the number of known plants by a factor of four between 1550 and 1700. The search for new methods for organizing and understanding this explosion of materials proliferated new systems of classification, by 1799, when Robert Thornton published his popular version of the Linnean system, he counted 52 different systems of botany. 41 classification systems were based on different part of plants. John Ray based his on the flower, calyx, and seed coat. Tornfort in Paris based his on the corolla and fruit. Albrecht von Haller, taking a very different approach, argued that geography was crucial to an understanding of plant life and that embryogenesis should also be represented in a system of classification. Despite the number and variety of systems, Linnaeus's taxonomy swept away these other systems and after in the 1740s, at least outside France, and until the first decades of the 19th century was generally considered the most convenient system of classification. Linnaeus founded his renowned key to the sexual system on the nuptia plantarum, the marriages of plants, that is, on the number of husbands, stamen, or wives, pistols, in a particular union. His famous system Anatory divided the vegetable world, as he called it, into classes based on the number, relative proportions, and position of the male parts or stamens. These classes were then subdivided into some 65 orders based on the number, relative proportions, and positions of the female parts or pistols. These were further divided into genera, based on the calyx, flower, and other parts of the fruit, species, based on the leaves or some other characteristic of the plant, and varieties. One might argue that Linnaeus founded his system on sexual difference because he was one of the first to recognize the biological importance of sexual reproduction in plants. Point 42 But the success of Linnaeus's system did not rest on the fact that it was natural, indeed Linnaeus readily acknowledged that it was highly artificial. Point 43 Though focused on reproductive organs, his system did not. 327. Capture fundamental sexual functions. Rather it focused on purely morphological features, i.e., the number and mode of union, exactly those characteristics of the male and female organs least important for their sexual function. 44. Furthermore, Linnaeus devised his system in such a way that the number of a plant's stamens, or male parts, determined the class to which it was assigned, while the number of its pistols, the female parts, determined its order. In the taxonomic tree, class stands above order. In other words, Linnaeus gave male parts priority in determining the status of the organism in the plant kingdom. There is no empirical justification for this outcome, rather Linnaeus brought traditional notions of gender hierarchy whole cloth into science. His new language of botany incorporated fundamental aspects of the social world as much as those of the natural world. Although today Linnaeus's classification of groups above the rank of genus has been abandoned, his binomial system of nomenclature remains, together with many of his genera and species. 45. My second example comes from zoological nomenclature. In 1758, in the tenth edition of his system Anatory, Carl Linnaeus coined the term mammalia, meaning literally of the breast, to distinguish the class of animals embracing humans, apes, ungulates, sloths, sea cows, elephants, bats, and all other organisms with hair, three ear bones, and a four chambered heart. 46 In so doing, he idolized the female mammy as the icon of that class. Historians of science have taken Linnaeus's nomenclature more or less for granted as part of his foundational work in zoological taxonomy. 47 There was, however, a complex gender politics informing Linnaean taxonomy and nomenclature. Why Linnaeus called mammals mammals had as much to do with the fact that there is something special about the female breast as with 18th century politics of wet nursing and maternal breastfeeding and the contested role of women in both science and the broader culture. 48. 
For over 2,000 years most of the animals we now designate as mammals, along with most reptiles and several amphibians, were called quadrupeds. Point 49 In coining his new term, Mammalia, Linnaeus did not draw from tradition, as was common in this period, but devised a wholly new term. Were there good reasons for Linnaeus to call mammals mammals? Does the longevity of Linnaeus's term reflect the fact that he was simply right, that the mammy, indeed, represent a primary, universal, and unique character of mammals, as would have been the parlance of the 18th century? Yes and no. Linnaeus chose this term even though naturalists in this period did not consider the mammy a universal characteristic of the class of animals he sought to identify, in the 18th century, it was commonly accepted that stallions lacked teats, Point 50 More importantly, the presence of milk-producing mammy is but one characteristic of mammals, as was commonly known to 18th century European naturalists. Linnaeus could indeed have chosen a more gender-neutral name, such as Pilosa, the hairy ones though hair, and especially beards was also saturated with gender, or oracaviga, the hollow-eared ones. 328. Or had he wished to emphasize the importance of mother's milk to the young, he could have chosen something like lactentia, the sucking ones, which, like the German term sogetier, suckling animals, nicely universalizes the term, since male as well as female young suckle at their mother's breasts. If Linnaeus had alternatives, if he could have chosen from a number of equally valid terms, what led him to the term mammal? Zoological nomenclature like all languages to some degree arbitrary, naturalists devise convenient terms to identify groups of animals. But nomenclature is also historic, growing out of specific contexts, conflicts, and circumstances. Linnaeus created his term mammalia partly in response to the question of humans' place in nature. 51 In his quest to find an appropriate term for a taxon uniting humans and beasts, Linnaeus made the Brea stand specifically the fully developed female breast icon of the highest class of animals. In privileging a uniquely female characteristic in this way, it might be argued that Linnaeus broke with long-standing traditions that saw the male as the measure of all things. It is important to note, however, that in the same volume in which Linnaeus introduced the term mammalia, he also introduced the term homo sapiens. This term of wisdom was used to distinguish humans from other primates, apes, lemurs, and bats, for example. In the language of taxonomy, sapiens is what is known as a trivial name. Point 52 From a historical point of view, however, the choice of the term sapiens is highly significant. Man had traditionally been distinguished from animals by his reason. Point 53 Thus, within Linnaean terminology, a traditionally masculine characteristic, reason, marks our separateness from brutes, while a female characteristic, the lactating mammy, ties humans to brutes. Though Linnaeus may have introduced the term mammalia into zoology, long before Linnaeus the female breast had been a powerful icon within Western cultures, representing both the sublime and bestial in human nature, which may have played a role in his focus on the breast. Point 54 The grotesque withered breasts on witches and devils represented temptations of wanton lust, sins of the flesh, and humankind fallen from paradise. The firm spherical breasts of Aphrodite the Greek ideal represented an otherworldly beauty and virginity. In the French Revolution, the bared female breast embodied in the strident Marianne became a resilient symbol of freedom. Point 55 From the multi breasted Diana of Ephesus to the fecund bosomed nature, the breasts symbolized generation, regeneration, and renewal. Myths and legends also portrayed suckling as a point of intimate connection between humans and beasts, suggesting the interchangeability of the maternal breast in this respect. A nanny goat, a Maldaya, was said to have nursed the young Zeus. 56 A she wolf served as the legendary nurse to Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. From the Middle Ages to the 17th and 18th centuries, bears and wolves were reported to have suckled abandoned children. Linnaeus himself believed that ancient heroes, put to the breast of lionesses, absorbed their very great courage along with their milk. 57 In rarer. 329. Instances humans were reported even to have suckled animals. Veronica Giuliani, 
beatified by Pius II, 1405-1464, took a real lamb to bed with her and suckled it at her breast in memory of the Lamb of God. 58 human suckling animals was also standard 18th century medical practice. As Mary Wollstonecraft lay dying after childbirth, the doctor forbade the child the breast and procured puppies to draw off the milk. 59. Linnaeus's fascination with female mammy arose alongside and in step with key political trends in the 18th century with restructuring of child care, the decline of the wet nurse and midwife and the restructuring of women's lives as mothers, wives, and citizens. Point 60 The portrait he painted of the naturalness of a mother giving suck to her young fed into movements to undermine the public power of women and to attach a new value to mothering. Most directly, Linnaeus joined the ongoing campaign to abolish the ancient custom of wet nursing. Linnaeus himself a practicing physician prepared a dissertation against the evils of wet nursing in 1752. In this treatise, entitled Step Nurse, or a dissertation on the fatal results of mercenary nursing, he alluded to his own taxonomy by contrasting the barbarity of women who deprive their children of mother's milk with the gentle care of great beasts whale, the fearsome lioness, and fierce tigress who willingly offer their young the breast. Point 61. To champions of enlightenment, the breast became nature's sign that women belonged in the home. It is remarkable that in the heady days of the French Revolution, when revolutionaries marched behind the fierce and bare-breasted liberty, the maternal breast figured in arguments against women exercising civic rights. Point 62 Delegates to the French National Convention, where many of these decisions were made, declared that nature had removed women from the political arena. In this case, the breasted ones were to be confined to the home. Point 63 Linnaeus's term mammalia helped legitimize the restructuring of European society by emphasizing how natural it was for females both human and non-human to suckle and rear their own children. Linnaean systematics sought to render nature universally comprehensible, yet the categories he devised infused nature with European notions of gender. Linnaeus saw females of all species as tender mothers, a parochial vision he, wittingly or unwittingly, imprinted on Europeans' understandings of nature. The Future of Gender in Science I chose these examples because they are foundational to the modern life sciences. Linnaeus's taxonomy and nomenclature were validated as the starting point of modern biological nomenclature by the international scientific community in 1905.64 Linnaeus may well have been innocent of the broader implications of his actions. There is no evidence, for instance, that Linnaeus intentionally chose a gender-charged term when he named mammals mammals. He may have done so naively, but not arbitrarily. He was led to his innovation in response to the world of human interests and political tensions. 330. Surrounding him. The fact that scientists might be unaware of the implications of their work does not make them any less mediators or marketeers of political ideas, for many this is a studied innocence. We need to begin to appreciate the contingencies of scientific knowledge, and especially what is foregone in the choice of one particular course rather than another. Scholarship on women and gender in science has a history stretching back at least to Christine de Pizan's 15th century query whether women have made original contributions in the arts and sciences. 65 Until recently, this debate was often sidelined in the history of science and intellectual history more generally. Nonetheless, Gender studies of science have come into their own in the late 20th century. In the 1960s, scholars working in this area tended to sketch the statistical dimensions of the problems women faced in science. Throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, they identified subtle and not so subtle institutional barriers. In the last 1980s and early 1990s, they began to analyze knowledge itself identifying as I have above how gender molded the very content of specific sciences. Today, scientists and science studies scholars concerned with gender are increasingly exploring how a critical awareness of gender can produce new knowledge and new disciplinary configurations. We are today beginning to chart the changes an awareness of gender has brought to the humanities, social sciences, and life sciences, especially medicine, primatology, and biology. 66 The ferment in knowledge of the past decade has in many instances reshaped what is known and knowable.